might be number 10. I've just been sent a message from Tom Hornsby from SRO saying that the number 9 car was involved in a warm-up fire, which doesn't sound pleasant. Uh, the number 10, I think this might just be a decision that's been made to start from the pit lane, but number 9, uh, from that message, I am um, reading between the lines rather, but we might not see it out there for the start of the race. OK, so we are in business then. The car's set off. It's going to be two formation laps at least, but of course this is the start of the race because it's a safety car start, so as soon as the safety car pulls away, uh, the race begins, the clock starts to tick, so the race is on, race in inverted commas, all of this eats into the allotted time, so safety car start, we know it's going to be at least two laps just to give the drivers a chance of getting tyres up to temperature, uh, we don't want to put the ams as they are in most cases at further risk for the opening stint. So the grid is in a sense a little academic, but what it is is the race order for the moment behind the safety car. So Michael O'Brien starts in the number two Jensen Team Rocket RJN, very heavy now with extra 50 kilos of weight. McLaren and Rob Collard will be behind him in the queue. Sam Dehaan is third, and then it's not Jordan Whit fourth because that car will start uh, now from the pit lane. Fifth on the grid would have been Angus Fender, but that car also is going to be missing. Adam Ballon, however, will start from sixth in the uh, Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini. Seventh, Ian Loggy. You just heard from his co-driver, Yama Berman, down on the grid. Eighth, Lewis Proctor in the Optimum McLaren. Starting ninth is Michael Igo, who has got Andrea Caldarelli, multiple uh, GT champion last year in the what was GT World Challenge Europe Sprint and Endurance Cups and overall as well. He's never raced at Donington before, but Michael Igo starts, then Nick Jones in the Team Parker Racing Bentley ahead of Stuart Proctor's Balfour McLaren. Richard Neary uh, is shown on the grid sheet as being the start driver in car number eight. Uh, the Team Abba Racing Mercedes and Duncan Cameron will go first in the AF Corsa uh, Ferrari. And then you've got the GT4 grid, which will run behind. Patrick Matheson uh, starts in number 58. James Kell next on that grid in the Speedworks Toyota. Matt Cowley, much underrated, impecunious young British driver. Matt Cowley starts the Academy Motorsport Ford Mustang. Exciting looking and sounding car, that. Jamie Caroline, British F4 champion, F3 race winner, is alongside teammate Patrick Kibble. Uh, then you've got Chris Westmail for HHC in the McLaren. Uh, ben Hurst, Century Motorsport BMW. And Mia Fluitt in the Bal. McLaren will be next on the grid. So that then is how the cars will run. And confirmation it is Richard Neary behind the wheel of the number eight Mercedes. That is what the timing screen is reflecting. So uh, Richard starts, Sam takes over. So one lap done, race order of course doesn't really change other than people either not being in the race or starting from the pit lane or dropping off the road. So this puts Jordan Witt, of course, to the back of the pack with work to do. It's good to have the AF Corsa Ferrari on the grid. Uh, Duncan Cameron and Matt Griffin were going to do the International GT Open Championship this year, but because of the fear over not being able to travel easily, they decided they'd come and do the British Series. AF Corsa has a British operation anyway, based at Silverstone, because it runs all the cars in the Ferrari UK Challenge. The team manager uh, of the operation in the UK, Riccardo Ragazzi, who is a name you'll be familiar with from GT World Challenge Europe, and and I've not been here since our last race at Donington, which was in 2004, when the Ferrari Challenge was for the Ferrari 360, which feels like a very old car. Yeah, it does, Rob. So that, was, that was a really uh, fun championship as well, and uh, as yeah. indeed the, the current Ferrari Challenge uh, has continued to be there. You can see the number 10 car then, Jordan Witt at the back. We haven't seen Angus Fender, his teammate, sadly, so the number 9 car appears to be too badly damaged after its warm-up incident. We may see it later in this race. We may see it for the one-hour race later on this afternoon, of course. Uh, they would like to get the car out there, I'm sure, because they both uh, had strong potential in Alton. The 9 car actually got the team's first podium for the championship in race 1. The 10 was leading race 1 when it was uh, given a penalty after the pit stop. So, uh, arguably, they should have come away with a lot more points from Alton Park than they did. And they both qualified well here. Fourth for the 10 car, fifth for the 9 car. Neither of them, of course, are going to now take up. Uh, those starting positions. It will be Baldwin that leads them when we go racing at the end of this lap. Uh, in second place, Rob Collard in the Barwell Lamborghini. Uh, third place, driver that was in a Barwell Lamborghini 12 months ago, Sam Dehan, who's made the uh, move across now to Ram Racing. Uh, fourth place, Adam Ballon in uh, the 72 Barwell Lamborghini. And Ian Loggy rounding out the top five. We will go racing, as Andy rightly says, this time around then. So we've got the cars coming now uh, down through the Melbourne hairpin, they get themselves into formation, ready for 
the start, but of course the race underway is not like a rolling start, so they can effectively go nose to tail. We've got a slight inconsistency from the grid in as much as Richard Neary has got himself ahead of Stuart Proctor. There they are, the McLaren should be back ahead and I think he's going back ahead which is sort of legit I know you're not meant to overtake but they are meant to be in grid order that puts you back into the correct order of the grid right so what is left the balance of two hours of racing at Donington Park is about to get underway GT3 GT4 cars blast away Michael O'Brien leads them from Rob Collard as they dive down towards Redgate Corner for the third time the first proper racing lap Sander Hahn is third ahead of Ballant Loggy and then Lewis Proctor as they swing their way onto the top of the crater curves and there Richard Neary says well I gave you your place back but I'm going to retake it under racing conditions he goes round the outside of Stuart Proctor as they hit the top of the crater curves down towards the old hairpin for the first time then Michael O'Brien championship leader is the first to discover exactly how slippery the old hairpin is right now they had that uh, 15 minute warm up session earlier on this morning but conditions may have evolved since then by Gligo in the WPI Motorsport Lamborghini. They had a brake problem in qualifying at Alton Park that put them towards the back of the grid and at such a tight circuit they just never were able to regain that track position so expect good things from the car that had quite a say in the outcome of the championship here towards the back end of last year. They weren't in the hunt for the championship but they were in the lead battle and they made their presence felt. Right now Michael is filling the mirrors of uh, Lewis Proctor in the Optima Motorsport McLaren with the Bentley of Nick Jones catching them. So Michael Igo, the Cheshire driver, hustling on, trying to gain places as ahead of him. Look, the battle is on, 96, which is the Lewis Proctor McLaren comes out to have a go around the outside of number six there. That is Ian Loggy not quite losing out because all over the curve goes Proctor. That gives Michael Igo a chance to go ahead of him. I go the right way, you go over the curve. So Lewis Proctor drops back and Michael Igo gets into the top six. Then defence, look on the way down to the Melbourne Happy. Nick Jones in the Bentley looking for a way past and out wide. There goes Sander Hahn, does he? The, no, it's Ian Loggy, in fact, in the green Mercedes who runs out wide. So Ian Loggy slithers wide. That gives Michael Igo another chance to gain a place, but he's on the outside line into Goddard, trying to go to the inside line. The McLaren, Lewis Proctor, trying every which way as the leaders go by. One second splits O'Brien from Collard at the end of lap one. Dehan is third, Ballon is fourth, and everybody else falling over themselves to be fifth. But Ian Loggy has just hung on as they come over the timing line. Yeah, Loggy got it all wrong going into the uh, Melbourne hairpin, locked the rear brakes, slid wide, did well to hang on to this fifth place. But Mike Ligo looks the raciest of this bunch, doesn't he? He's already uh, managed to find a way past Lewis Proctor, and now he wants to break into the top five. And he wants to do it quickly because already these five are some 3.6 seconds behind Adam Ballon in four, and they are over seven seconds of the race lead. Again, Loggy is wide at the old hairpin. But the wide line sometimes is where the grip might be. I'm not convinced he was out there intentionally, though. That car doesn't look stable under braking. The Lamborghini looks to have more grip, but can it find a way through? At the moment, the answer is no, but Michael Igo looks really pacey in the early stages. He does, but he's a bit stuck now behind Ian Loggy, who is experienced in GT terms, having uh, raced initially Bentleys, came out of brick car, didn't he, and had a spell racing in Europe. But Ian Loggy then, for the moment, hanging on to that fifth place, Michael Igo who's done a lot of racing in a very short space of time, the and from Nutsford, largely in Lamborghinis. He's also had some great co-drivers to gain experience from. It's Andrea Kelder rally this weekend, and there he is riding shotgun as they come down towards the S's and log in a little bit deeper. I go maybe braver by rattling over the curb, but this is the battle that's on now for fifth and sixth places. I go busy on the lights to try to distract Ian Loggy, but I'm not sure that's going to work necessarily. He has a look on the inside line, but it is a two-hour race, this. There is a long way to go, so... There's an element of self-preservation needed here for the Ams to get to the pit stops. Really, keep the car in the hunt. Let your pro do the hard yards in that second stint. Uh, yes, indeed. And Igo really wants to try and get this trap position, though, doesn't he? And Loggy, again, just doesn't have the confidence under braking. He's had a couple of wobbles, and now he's braking a bit earlier. He's a bit more tentative uh, on the brake pedal, and that could give Igo the chance to get through. For the time being, though, the order stays the same. O'Brien has a 1.2-second lead at the front over Rob Collard. Sander had a further 1.8 seconds back in third and then another second and a half back to balance. The top four are pretty equidistant. The real racing going on behind them. Jordan Whit, by the way, has just moved up his first position. He's now 11th overall uh, ahead of Stuart Proctor in the Balfe Motorsport McLaren, making a welcome return uh, to the GT3 ranks this weekend, Balfe, but uh, a little off the pace, perhaps, in the wet conditions. Yeah, Jordan Whit doing a good job, isn't he? Because he's worked his way past all the GT4 cars now, uh, and he's starting to pick them off as best he can. Uh, within GT3, so that's his next target. He's at the back of Duncan Cameron, so now his real race, if you like, in class starts. The leading GT4 car currently is there, number 97, Jamie Caroline, in the Aston, very nearly getting into the back there of Stuart Proctor's GT3 McLaren.
and he's being held up a little bit and that therefore means that Patrick Matisse is closing up so the GT4 lead battle Whisper it being held up by a GT3 car. Stuart Proctor, who's come from the pure McLaren GT series. I hate to take any of the way, but that GT3 car is a handful if you're inexperienced in these conditions. The GT4 cars, less powerful, but more user-friendly. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I think that is that is pure confidence or lack of the Proctor. He just doesn't have the confidence to send it into the corners. And that is why he's fallen so far behind the rest of the GT3 pack. And of course, it's backing up. Uh, the 97 Aston Martin of Jamie Caroline into the second place GT4 car of Patrick Matiasen and uh, these uh, are the two cars that are tied for the championship lead at the moment in GT4 33 points apiece for these two uh, Jamie Caroline really needs to get through the trouble is he's better through the corners than Proctor's GT3 McLaren but as soon as they get onto anything vaguely resembling a straight the McLaren has that extra power and gets back away and it's so hard to pass a car that's quicker than you in a straight line very true indeed yes they tied for GT4 honours but they haven't had a win yet they've done it on points change because I go is ahead of Loggy as you saw fifth and sixth have reversed themselves and there now is 97 so Jamie Caroline adapting well isn't he to GT4 cars comes through the more experienced GT campaigner Patrick Matisson is behind him and then we've also had a change for third in class Patrick Kibble in the second of the TF Sport Aston Martins it feels odd not talking about TF in the context of GT3 or Johnny Adam uh, there in third in the class now at the expense of James Kell in the Toyota Supra. Michael O'Brien leads the way, but Rob Collard in second place has done the fastest lap of the race, so he's not letting the leading McLaren get away. Now, what's about to happen for second within GT4? Could be a change imminently as there are the leaders on this lap. You've got to say that the McLaren of Michael O'Brien, second generation racer, looks the race here. Yes, he's just pulled out four tenths in the middle sector. Uh, yes, he has. Collard with the fastest lap last time around, 143.4, was two tenths quicker. The gap did come down to 1.1, as there is uh, Ian Logan down to sixth place now. Once Igo has gone through, Igo is now the fastest car on the track, fastest in both of the first two sectors on this lap. That gap is really starting to creep up, and I reckon he's probably catching uh, Adam Ballon in fourth. And of course, the next battle will be McLaren now versus Mercedes. The other one to watch is Michael Igo, because he has just done two absolute best in the sectors. Now that he's got clear real estate ahead of him, Michael Igo could be on for the fastest lap of the race here, except Michael O'Brien's got other ideas, and Michael O'Brien is now the quickest man on the road, extending the margin over Rob Collard to a second and a half. Igo breaks the beam, goes quicker, 142.6, suggesting, yes, I know the cars are getting lighter, but maybe now the road is just starting to be, not drier, but a little less wet. And they're learning all the time as well. They know where the grip is now, they know what they, which line they need to take to find the speed, in theory. Anyway, look at the way that he is closing on the Barwell Lamborghini in front of Ballon. On the previous lap, he was over a second and a half quicker, uh, the gap down to two and a half seconds, so within the next lap or so, we could have a fight for fourth place, we already know have a fight for sixth here as Lewis Proctor in the Optimum uh, McLaren chases down Ian Loggy in car number six. Optimum had a solid start to the season at Alton, a second and a fifth, uh, making the switch of course from Aston Martin to McLaren this year and they are looking for a way through here but Ian Loggy, he's made a couple of mistakes early on but seems almost, now that he's let Igo go or now that igo has gone through, whichever it was, Loggy seems to have calmed down a little bit now, he's making fewer mistakes and that's making it harder for the McLaren to find a way past. Yeah, getting into a rhythm, isn't he, really? So, I go is I gone, because uh, he's up past him. 58 there in GT4, Patrick Matisson for the HHC Motorsport team. He's dropped back from the leader markedly because he's having to go defensive here. Patrick Kibble comes up to have a look on the inside line, and he might get the job done going into copies here. Matisson gives him racing room as best he can. He tries to defend almost side-by-side side into copies Up the curve goes the McLaren, and that should give the place to the highlighter pen that's on the inside line there, the bright yellow Aston Martin will go through spot that a mile away, never mind the lights except the McLaren, better on the aero, good in a straight line and back through goes Patrick Matisse and great battle here. Yeah and it's bringing into play now James Kell in fourth place for the Speedworks team, they're looking for the first ever podium in the championship for that car and they don't have a success penalty to serve either, look how defensively the number 58 McLaren is driving Patrick Matisse takes a very tight line into the Melbourne hairpin and this is so frustrating for Patrick Kibble behind. He just can't find a way through. And now they've been joined by Kel. He has to be extra careful. If he goes offline to try and make a move uh, work, if it, if it doesn't work, he loses momentum. The Toyota will pounce immediately. So three cars tied together here by a very short piece of string, scrapping over second place in GT4. Which is just what it should be. Three different brands, very, very evenly matched. The BOP working nicely. 
good talented drivers across all cars as well down towards Redgate corner they died we've had the first 15 minutes of the race completed we've got good action thus far we've had already action with off the road Jordan Witt so he'd worked his way up into 11th place and then slithers off the road up at Coppice didn't seem to lose a place there but when have done the tyres a huge amount of good bringing dirt onto the road as well with respect he only had one place to lose and that was to Stuart Proctor who's some eight seconds behind him now after that moment Jordan hasn't looked happy in these conditions had he, he, was, uh, he was struggling in warm-up and uh, unfortunately uh, having started the pit lane is not going forward Ian Loggy was going too far into the chicane there though outbraked himself again not the first time we've seen that and now he's having to defend once more from Lewis Proctor who had dropped back a car length or so I'd venture uh, earlier on in this lap Proctor goes to the outside into the Melbourne hairpin now which car has the best traction well it's not McLaren is it big big tail slide then he gets on the curve and loses even more ground so uh, Loggy keeping him at bay and then dropping now as well Nick Jones in the park racing Bentley he has fallen back to the tune of about two and a half seconds right now as they come through to complete the eighth lap of the race absolutely right so the race leading gap still a second and a half uh, Sam Dehaan is now having a turn of being the fastest man on the road he's now done the fastest lap and has brought the gap down to 1.8 seconds against Rob Collard in second spot as we look back at the twitching McLaren there of Lewis Proctor uh, Dad Stewart still hanging on to what was 12th place overall that's second third and fourth remember within GT4 that looking at all of which plays into the hands of Jamie Caroline who is away and gone up the road down now into the left of Goddard they come and James Kell number 23 in that Speedworks uh, Toyota the car overseen uh, by Mickey Sargent experienced uh, team manager from Triple Eight days in touring cars from BMR. Uh, he's looking after this for the Morpeth driver James Kell, who was in Ginetta Super Cup last season. Now, of course, adapting, as so too is his co driver Sam Smelt, to double driver races. It's another part oh, having to share a car, having to compromise on setup and everything else. Yeah, James is quick in anything, though. He, uh, I, he first sort of uh, came to my attention in uh, Mazda MX5 one one mate racing which is a very competitive form of racing very popular form of racing here in the uk uh, then made that uh, successful transition to Ginettas and uh, slightly more powerful cars so we've got the leaders here coming up the hill the gap between michael o'brien and rob collard at the start of the lap was a second and a half i reckon it's a little smaller now and in third place sam dehan as well worth mentioning here as well the top three cars o'brien collard and dehan they're all silver graded drivers Adam Ballon and Mike Ligo are doing a really good job to more or less match their lap times as bronze-graded AM drivers, uh, and they are by far and away the quickest AM drivers in the field right now. So whilst these three are pulling away a little bit, you'd expect in the second stint of the race, once the pros jump on board the 18 Lamborghini and the 72 Lamborghini, who have just changed places, by the way. I go ahead of Ballon, according to the timing screen, for fourth place. Uh, but if they can stay in contention now, then uh, they may well be a factor for the victory. Certainly the 18 car, I think, with no pit stop penalty, they may be a factor in the second half of the race. As there, look, diving to the inside of Matisse, and it's Patrick Kibble for second in GT4 at the Melbourne Hep, and he's gone through, he'll go wide. Matisse looks to get the switch back, and are they going to lean on each other? No, because the Aston has got the drag out of the corner. So, it's an Aston Martin 1-2 in GT4. So it's closing up for the overall lead. It's also now had a change for second in GT4. Can the Toyota go through off the road? Goes Kibble. So one up and at least one down. Two down, in fact, because he runs off the road and back on again. We had a similar situation in the earlier Porsche Sprint Challenge race at the start of the day. So you get all giddy. You've gained the speed. You've gained the place. And then you run out of road going into Goddard. So Kibble was second for about a corner. And now he is uh, down in class. But can he fight back? The answer is yes. As he dives into Redgate corner fending off the McLaren, the second of the HHC McLarens there, which is Chris Westmail's car. Right, now up front, Michael O'Brien leads by 1.6 seconds. Rob Collard, second, is 1.9 seconds ahead of Sam Dehaan. But Collard is going to get an extra 15 seconds in the pit stop. So Sandy Mitchell is really up against it in the second stint as you get that replay of Patrick Kibble just running out of grip, running out of brakes, running out of room and going onto the grass. Yeah, but you work so hard to get past that car in front because you want the track position. And when, when you've got the track position, there's kind of this need to, to capitalise on it immediately. Hope you've seen a few times today. It doesn't always work out that way. Fastest lap of the race for Sam Dehan in third place. The Ram Racing Mercedes, a 142.2, fractionally quicker than Rob Collard. They were both, though, about half a second quicker than Mike O'Brien that time. So the lead gap down to 1.1 keeps ebbing and flowing as they uh, continue to try and get to grips with the uh, conditions. Of course, that will uh, become even harder to do once they arrive on the tail of the GT4 traffic a little bit later on in the race. But uh, Mercedes 
looking strong. And again, a bit like in GT4, three different makes of car here running in the top three. So much for McLaren domination. Absolutely right. However, there is a long way to go. So factor in the weight, factor in the pit stops, factor in the pace of the drivers in that second stint. It could be a very different story. Now, in GT4, battle is on for second place. Patrick Matisse is still not out of the proverbial woods because he's got James Kell tucked up behind him as they come over the timing line now. So James Kell breaks the beam. What is he now? Just fractions of a second, half a second back from that McLaren. So you've got the McLaren second, deep into Redgate. James Kell with a tighter line comes up much, much closer now for second in GT4 as they hit the top of the crane and curves out of Hollywood, down through the crane as they go. This is now lap 11. Of course, we're a long way off the pit stops yet. Another 40 minutes plus for the GT3 cars, just under 40 minutes for GT4. And there, Patrick Matisse goes ever so slightly deep into the old hairpin. James Kell not able to take advantage there as now they make this long, long, long climb up the hill. The McLaren is taking the sort of traditional race, uh, wet racing line, isn't it? Round the outside. Look how wide from the apex he is. Yeah. The Toyota goes in much tighter and yet still gets off the corner well. And I think that's the difference between a mid-engine McLaren and a front-engine Toyota and Aston Martin. They've just got more front grip with that extra weight over the front wheels. And that maybe means they can take the shorter, tighter, more traditional dry uh, racing line and still come off the corner as well. So it's a fascinating battle, this. It's not just three different makes of car, but they're built differently, they're designed differently, they're set up differently, and they've all got different drivers who have different driving styles. And uh, look at it, there's nothing to choose between them. I, I reckon the Toyota and the Aston Martin definitely are fractionally quicker uh, than Matthias and in the McLaren, but he has, for now at least, the track position. Although James Kell is about to try and have a go on the inside. Look at the Melbourne hairpin. McLaren on the outside, Toyota on the inside. Kell gets up alongside, he's got his nose in front now, a bit like the Aston, the front engine grunt and go Supra, should be good out of the corner, it is but not good enough, it's on the outside line and Kell is in jeopardy because up the inside dives Patrick Kibble, so he was going for a place, he's ended up losing one, so Patrick Matheson, doesn't matter what you throw at him in this battle, he's able to fend the ball off, so now he's got that Aston Martin back behind him. He's been there already. He knows roughly where he needs to be defending. That said, Patrick Kibble might still come under big attack from James Kell, who will be really, really Albert's mother about losing a place there. And he'll be on the attack as they go now down through the crane of curves on this lap 12. So easy to do when you're attacking and defending at the same time. If you go for the move and it doesn't work, it can end up costing you. That's what happens to James Kell. And he falls down into fourth place again in GT4. No doubt about it. 95 Aston Martin is the quickest in this group, Patrick. Kibble, TF Sport already lead uh, GT4 outright at the moment with Jamie Caroline, and they'd like to make it a 1-2. Look at the glue! Look at the glue! <laughs> it's horrible! I was about to say, we can see the leaders coming into Redgate. We can't really, can we? I think the conditions are getting worse out there. Oh, and now there is the traffic. It's like commentating through cataracts. As I said, it's appalling that the drivers in the cars have got even less opportunities that we haven't seen things. But Michael O'Brien leads the pack there by over a second. And now, as you've just seen, we've got the traffic to factor into all of this as well. So Michael O'Brien, one of a number of drivers that came out of the McLaren Driver Development Programme, leading the way as uh, you're riding on board with him as they come up now towards McLean's. It is Michael O'Brien up front. He was a second to the good over... Rob Collard and Rob getting through the traffic as well. Sander Hard though is closer to Collard now than Collard is to O'Brien. So you're looking back from the leader's car, but it's second and third. You can just see them in the background where it's all kicking off. That means the three leading cars are covered by two seconds. It is getting very, very competitive indeed here. The McLaren all larded up with its extra 50 kilos since Alton Park as against the 30 on the silver pairings in the uh, Lamborghini and Mercedes. It just can't escape. Nor can Patrick Matisse escape because he's got Kibble and Kell breathing down his neck. Yep, still as close as ever. And James Kell, having lost that place, is not being shaken off by the HHC McLaren and TF Sports Aston Martin in front. Battle for 14th overall, but it's second place in GT4. And now they're being caught by even more, as if this wasn't entertaining enough. Chris Westmail and Matt Cowley in the Academy Motorsport Ford Mustang are closing in. Look at the lead. It's the entire length of the Grainer Curves and more, uh, separating first and second in GT4. Fourth car in shot there, the second of the HHC McLarens. Chris Westmail celebrates his, his uh, 25th birthday today. Jordan Whit, though, hasn't had much cause to celebrate today. It's not the first time he's gone around at the chicane. I was about to say, he's been making progress. He was ninth, actually. He got himself ahead of Duncan Cameron's Ferrari, ahead of Nick Jones's Bentley. But sadly, all of that hard work undone. And that's the sister car still being worked on. Driver ready to get in, Angus Fender, and you might think, well, look, they've lost 25 minutes. What is the point? The point is, you treat it as a test session. Make sure the car is good 
for the one-hour race later on as now Patrick Kibble is going to have another go against the McLaren. He's up the kerb coming out of Coppice. They are side by side. Right, which is better? Grunt or Aero? It's Aero because the McLaren goes back through. Look, the rather smelter lines of the McLaren putting back ahead of the Aston Martin. And James Kell thinking, go on, go on, get into each other, delay each other, give me a chance here to get up the inside. The Danish driver, Patrick Matheson, is ahead. He moves across, look to cover off the inside line, down to the hairpin. Patrick Kibble sits in the spray. James Kell is there. And they're being caught by not only Chris Westmale, but also Matt Cowley as well. So pretty much you're going to have most of GT4 in a line for second place and back. McLaren, Aston Martin, Toyota and Ford all represented in this group. Uh, the McLaren slightly outnumbering the others. Maybe they can try a bit of a pincer movement here on uh, uh, Kibble uh, in the, in the uh, Aston Martin, excuse me, and uh, Kell in the Toyota. Across the line they go. Terrific racing this, isn't it? We were a little concerned, I think, that the slippery conditions might lead to some slightly cautious driving out there, but I'm not seeing much uh, evidence of that at the moment. They are so close together, these five. You've got uh, Matisson back to Cowley is only about two seconds, I reckon, between second down to fifth, as in the GT3 ranks, that is the optimum McLaren. Uh, now starting to feel the heat from Richard Neary in the Ram Race Mercedes. I don't know if Lewis Proctor's had a moment here because he's dropped back considerably from Ian Loggy uh, in the uh, Ram Racing Mercedes of the road. Uh, and remember, he is a silver-graded driver up against a couple of bronze-graded drivers. Just going back to GT4 for a moment, don't forget, though, that, of course, the top two in GT4 both get longer pit stops because of their successes at Alton Park. So Jamie Caroline's car that leads will get an extra 15 seconds, and their number 58, Patrick Matisse's car, will get an extra 10 and he's under attack anyway now because right there behind him is Patrick Kibble and you've also got James Kell on his tail also as they dive through coppice and where in all of this there he is Chris Westmayer and here Matt Cowley who was racing in European GT4 a season ago as I say much underrated driver that was an absolute gun in Formula 4 1600 went off to America to race there uh, if there were a proper budget behind it, he would have gone much, much further. As coming out of the chicane, now through the S's, up the inside line, tries to go. Patrick Kibble, and again, he's got the inside line. Patrick Matisse moves across, he gives him racing room. Aston gets up the inside, can the McLaren get the switch back? Where's the Toyota in all of this? Up the inside as well, but I think it's job done, finally, for Patrick Kibble. Note to self, Patrick. <laughs> Left, next corner. Break earlier. He's going to do it, I think, this time. We can finally say he's oh. got the place, but not there, I'm afraid, Ian Loggy, because he is in... No, sorry, Richard Neary is in strife in the ABBA Mercedes. A double rotation now up at Coppice. Oh, dear. They were running in eighth place. They were applying the pressure to Lewis Proctor. We saw them about half a lap ago, uh, but fortunately, that battle is now put on ice. Right, so we now do have a TF Sport 1-2 in GT4. The two cars are separated by 15 seconds uh, because it's taken Patrick Kibble so long to break through the defences of Patrick Matthiasson. He is now getting away, though, and he successfully negotiated the Goddard Herb in that time. So he will now attempt to set sail and, uh, and make good his escape at the front of the field. But 97, as you said, does have a 15-second success penalty, whereas 95 does not because it was taken out in that incident late on at Alton. Now this is the uh, GT3 Pro-Am area where you've got Nick Jones coming under attack from Duncan Cameron. There is the recovering Richard Neary and the recovering Jordan Witt. Now in fairness, Jordan is one of the silvers, but he's running with the Pro-Ams after at least two spins that we can account for. On top of his pit lane start, we probably remember behind all of the GT4 cars as well. He was off the road a fair few times in the warm-up session this morning as there, Richard Neary dive-bombs Duncan Cameron, so the... Mercedes, arguably a good car to have in these conditions, oh, goes no. ahead, goes sideways, and he hangs on to an almighty tank slapper. Oh, so nearly wiped out Jordan the win in the process. And Jordan, blimey, that was opportunistic. He got between the two of them, one of which was the Ferrari that's really struggling in these conditions, one of which was a sideways Mercedes. So Jordan the win gains two places, probably with his eyes closed there, in one fell swoop. That was so close to disaster. It's that side-to-side -side contact that they came within millimetres of then that can so easily break the suspension and end your race. But thankfully, if they made contact, it was very slight. Uh, they got away with no damage. But uh, yeah, Jordan Witt, uh, he's got speed, hasn't he? And he's got good racecraft. It's just uh, a little bit of inconsistency creeping in today. If he keeps it on the road, though, he should get past Nick Jones fairly shortly and leave the three Pro-Am cars to fight over third place within their class, actually. Nick Jones has, um, no, fourth place, excuse me, in class. Nick Jones uh, in fourth in the Team Park Bentley that will start on the front row overall for race two later on today. Which is based on a uh, drive oh. time in Q2. Nick Jones over the curb and out wide, so up past him goes Jordan Witt, up past him goes Richard Neary, 
and Duncan Cameron is brought into the mix, but that Ferrari is not enjoying the wet, is it? The AF Corsa Ferrari, Duncan Cameron, don't forget, is massively experienced and specialises in racing Ferraris. He is really struggling because the overall race leader, Michael O'Brien, is in and amongst the traffic. The lead gap is now less than a second. There is Rob Collard in second place. It's all a bit new to him, of course, these double driver shared car races. In third position, getting stuck in the traffic now is Sam De Haan. So that gives Collard a bit of breathing space. And look, he's almost up with O'Brien now as the traffic plays a part. Out of the way gets James Kell. But Collard is back at the races, isn't he? Because he's right there on the tail of the uh, team rocket RJN McLaren. Down Starkey straight they come. And it's game on for the race lead because there's less than a length in it here on lap 17. Yeah, Rob Collard may be new to GT racing, but what he can do is overtake. He developed a real reputation for being a proper racer in his uh, long and illustrious touring car career. Uh, partly because he can't qualify to save his life, as he'll admit himself, and that sort of left him with no choice but to work his way through the order on a number of occasions. He only has one pass to make here, though, to get that Farwell Lamborghini into the race lead. They're dropping Sam De Haan in traffic slightly, so it is rather McLaren versus Lamborghini for the race lead. We are already more than half an hour into this third round of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. It's turning in to an absolute thriller already. Michael O'Brien leads the way in the number two uh, Team Rocket RJN uh, McLaren, don't forget though, of these three cars at the front, 278 and 69, the two car that's leading is the only one that doesn't have to serve a success penalty in the pit stops because, of course, they served that in race two at Alton Park. They won the first race, had to spend longer in the pits for race two, and that's actually benefiting them now here a couple of weeks later at Donington. Yeah, if you can plan when to win, that was the perfect way of doing it. And of course, if you can win this race, you get points and a half because it's a longer race. So Again, there's a benefit to doing well in this rather than in the later race today as Collard now comes up to have a go at Michael O'Brien. And they're in the traffic as well, so Michael's defending but also trying to work his way past the traffic. 95 there, Patrick Kibble is negotiated by one, now by two. Here comes Rob Collard up on the inside line. And yes, he spent many a year in the School of Hard Knocks, the British Touring Car Championship, so we know he can overtake, we know he can race. But of course, in these cars, you can't run as much as you can in a touring car. You can't lean, for example. Mechanically, they're pretty much bulletproof, but it's the bodywork and it's the aero that you can really jeopardise if you do start to get a bit leery. Down towards the S's goes in third place, Sam De Haan, and he does not want to be left behind either. Uh, no, he's had the pace to run with them, but in traffic, I don't think he's been quite as committed to the overtakes against the GT4 cars, but the good news is that they've just lapped the GT4 leader, Jamie Caroline, so no more traffic in the immediate future. It took them the best part of half an hour, actually, to uh, get to this stage again, so they might just catch the back of the GT4 pack before they pit, uh, but uh, it will be just as the pit lane window opens, I reckon. Ian Lockie, by the way, set the fastest lap a few laps ago, 141.899, the number six Ram Racing Mercedes is running down in sixth place, third of the Pro-Am cars, as we now get to see the genuine pace, if you like, of Michael O'Brien versus Rob Collard again. Through the first part of the race in clean air, the McLaren seemed able to keep Rob at arm's length, but now that Rob's got a sniff of the race lead, he's not going to let that McLaren escape easily. Don't forget, that McLaren is 20 kilos heavier with the extra weight given to it under an adjustment of the BOP, so the McLaren then is heavier, and is that starting to tell now, late in the stint? There, the road looking a little bit drier, but at other parts of the circuit, it is completely, completely opposite. Up towards Coppice, in a moment they will come. This is McLean's, an hour and 26 on the clock. Remember, GT3 cars can stop after 62 minutes, GT4 after 58. The reason being to try to clear the pit lane a little bit, so you don't have everybody in all at once. Donington, great circuit, modernised pit lane a good decade or so ago now, but it's still not the biggest of pit lanes, so to give the teams room to work, the pit window unofficial window is slightly staggered as there up the inside line tries to go 72 out of ballon he's in the traffic but of course the car behind is the one to watch ian loggy looking for a way past him he as andy has said has done that fastest lap of the race and he's a man on a mission to try to get himself up past the bar while lamborghini but he can't do it at the s's yep this is for uh, fifth place outright second in the pro-am element of the gt3 category the mercedes has closed in on the uh, lamborghini and now it goes to the inside line meanwhile lamborghini on mclaren for the race leader uh, was ooing and ahhing half a lap ago because michael o'brien ran very wide at coppice got a big slide coming out of the corner rob collard closed in and i fancy they were very close through the melbourne loop because they 
they've somehow lost some uh, quite a bit of time to Sam De Haan. De Haan is the one to watch because he's now lapping quicker than the two ahead of him by eight tenths of a second. You can see how close he's got to Collard. Now that's great news for O'Brien because if he can stack back the Lamborghini into the clutches of the Mercedes, he can get away. But downhill they go then now through this first sector. Sam De Haan in that Mercedes, the front engine Mercedes AMG GT3 has been looking good. He's actually fractionally slower this time within sector one, but he is now back on the tail of Rob Collard. He was four tenths adrift at the Lamborghini, that was half a second adrift at the Lini McLaren. So second and third fractionally closer than the gap, first or second up now towards McLean's they come. And remember, they've got just over 25 minutes of their stint to go. Collard up the curb, Sam De Haan again rather impudently flashing the lights and a veteran of national racing, but Rob Collard not to be denied. And Michael O'Brien is not getting away up front, try as he might. No, and to make the point again, you could actually let these two go and in theory still re-inherit the lead again at the pit stops, but you don't want to hand over your car in third place if you can hand it over in the race lead. And uh, he's a racer, is Michael, and he wants to try and say at the end of this stint that he kept Bob Collard, one of Britain's best-known racers, behind him for the entire stint. And you're right, Dahan has very much arrived on their tail now. So look at this, over half an hour into the race, and this is the fight between the top three cars. They've got a tier sport... Aston Martin ahead of them, which I'm guessing is Patrick Kibble. Well, I hadn't noticed that they'd got past the rest of the GT4 field, yes. so uh, they, they have to begin. Okay, so they're uh, they're catching the TF Aston now. Now, was O'Brien slightly wide coming out of Goddard's that time? Of course, Rob Collard wants to get out of this car fairly swiftly, ready to watch his sub Jordan in the second stint because Jordan will take over the 58 McLaren. Uh, Won't be tired that gets in the way of Dad there during its stint, but uh, the car comes out of. Redgate now Michael O'Brien's leading McLaren six tenths to the good he was he's always got the ability to just maintain that modest gap but never go storming away I don't think we've ever had the gap of more than a second and a half throughout the entire race have we? Uh, no we haven't they've been nose to tail pretty much since the drop of the green flag as well Adam Ballon is keeping Ian Loggy at bay but he's having a few moments especially in traffic and we've seen this a bit from Adam in the past he's a quick racer don't get me wrong but Sometimes in traffic, a bit like Sam Dahan, who was his teammate, of course, in the sister car last year. Uh, it's that decisiveness that you need to get past the slower runners uh, that maybe he struggles with. But actually, having said that, he's gapped in Loggy as they got past the 95 car, second place in GT4. There's an incident being investigated, by the way, between cars 10 and 8. 10 is Jordan Witt's two C's motorsport McLaren because he hasn't had enough drama already today. Uh, and 8 is Richard Neary. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong, but we never saw how Richard ended up on the grass in the first place when he had that spin of coffee, so I wonder if it might be related to the, uh, to the McLaren. Yeah, we did see Jordan go back past, didn't we, with that bold effort coming out of Redgate. Leading gap, though, is coming down again here as they come to the Melbourne hairpin. Lap 21, Collard is now close enough to attack. And look at the GT4 Aston breaking late, coming back up on the outside of the GT3 Mercedes, but it's three for the leader. They're side by side almost for the race lead now. Up towards Goddard, this is Rob Collard's chance of leading. He's on the outside. He needs to break fractionally earlier and try to duck up the inside, which he does. The McLaren on the outside line looking for grip, though. Now down towards Redgate. This is Collard's opportunity, except that the McLaren just, despite the weight, stretches the gap slightly in a straight line. Collard has got to be mindful as well of the Mercedes behind. Into the race goes Angus Fender, but the race leaders go to the top of the Craner curves. Go away, Sam De Haan thinks Rob Collard, because as long as I'm defending from you, I can't have a go for the race lead. But that said, good through Hollywood is Collard. He was fractionally nearer, but by the bottom of the Craner curves, O'Brien has just pulled back another car's length fascinating to see how elasticated this situation is as we work lap 22 and the different lines are playing into this it looks as though O'Brien is losing so much time on corner entry but then he sort of squirts off the corners quite a bit quicker than the cars behind and the gap goes back out and now look Sam Dehan is applying more pressure to Rob Collard but Collard is able to apply to Michael O'Brien so it continues to yo-yo three quarters of a second all that separate these three and they are costing themselves time Michael Igo in fourth position on the previous lap uh, was, let's have a look, yeah, nearly a second quicker than them, 7.2 seconds back, but uh, hey, I wouldn't say no to adding a fourth car into that mix before the uh, halfway point. Indeed so, and uh, we're not far off that pit window, shepherding things up yet further, as Michael O'Brien, Rob Collard, Sam Dehan covered by seven tenths of a second here in GT4. Uh, we have got James uh, Kell up ahead of both of the HHC McLarens now, so he's taken another step forward, so you've got Caroline ahead of Kibble, ahead of Kell, this is the top three outright as they make the run up towards Goddard's end, lap 22. And the leading car, Michael O'Brien, 
in his mirrors sees Sam de Haan crawling all over the back of Rob Collard. Through they turn, out of the left hand and now of Goddard's up towards the timing line. Michael O'Brien, another of the young drivers that we picked up by McLaren's driving development programme a few seasons back, hanging on to the race lead to give this car over to James Baldwin. It's going to be fascinating set and sit to see how James gets on against more experienced real-world drivers. Comes with this big reputation after Alton Park, but Michael O'Brien likewise showing what he's capable of. Of course, the danger of being a GT4 on occasions, you get a bit overshadowed. Here in a GT3 car, you're running on the front, and he goes a little, a little wide, maybe, if he held half in that time, but he's still there, still clear, still leads. It almost looked like, as he turned in, the rear got a bit loose underneath him. You mentioned that car is heavier than those around it. Now, that won't necessarily affect your overall pace as much in the wet. The wet is, as they always say, a great uh, leveller. But you are probably still working your tyres a bit hard because of carrying the extra weight. So you're able to go the same speed, but maybe those tyres, those Pirelli tyres, are starting to cry enough. They head uh, back out of coppice once again. The gaps are pretty static for the time being. But Mike Ligo, again, was a full uh, half a second or more quicker than them. The gap between third place to Han and fourth place Igo is now in the deep, uh, is now less than uh, six seconds as we go back to the fight here uh, for fifth place in GT4. And, uh, uh, Chris Westmail, Westmail and uh, Matt Cowley in the Academy Mustang, which was on for a podium at Alton Park and race one before a spin up on Ireland Bend. Another team who feel that they are almost owed a good result this time around. Interesting as well, isn't it, that Academy has switched from Aston Martin to the Mustang for this year. Had all sorts of problems in the European GT4 series last year with the Astons. And, of course, we saw how well the Multimatic run cars went in British GT4 a season ago. I think he said Prio amongst others. But uh, Matt Nichol-Jones team running the Mustang, and it's going well. Good grunty car. It will be handed over for the second stint of the race to Jordan Albert. Very rapid single seater gun as there it comes up to have a go at the McLaren of Chris Westmail then. So the two HHC McLarens are together, but they're about to be split, are they? Matt Cowley up the inside line. Yes, he might even get two of them here because he's run 57 out wide to get the place. 58 goes wide as well. Can the big powerful Ford Mustang? Get itself ahead, not quite on the inside line there. Look, Patrick Matisse hangs on to it. Richard Neary dive bombs all of them. The Mustang's off the road, and out of all of that, he's 57. Chris Westmail that gains two places. He just sat back and let that happen then. That was uh, Richard Neary in the Team Abba Racing Mercedes pulling a lap on them, uh, and he was three abreast going into the uh, final hairpin at Goddard's. That rarely works in the dry, especially in the wet where there is a limited amount of grip on a fairly small uh, part portion of the track. Uh, now, though, the Academy Mustang back alongside again. Matt Cowley tries once more to uh, overhaul Matthiasen in the HHC McLaren, who started quite a bit further up the road than the cars around it. And we've had a change for the lead, I think, have we? This is on board with Michael O'Brien, looking back not at a Barwell Lamborghini, but at a Ram Racing Mercedes, because there, Rob Collard has done it. He's got the lead away from Michael O'Brien and already maybe starting to pull away. Didn't see where he got it done, but that was a long time coming. Indeed so. Not only is he ahead, he's pulling away. The incident that you were talking about earlier on between Witt and Neary, no further action. We're getting track limit warnings as well now for 96, which is Lewis Proctor's McLaren. So Rob Collard leads as he comes in the Lamborghini out of the uh, Goddard's left-hander over the timing line. And having hit the front, he's already over a second clear which, of course, is very important indeed, given that he's going to lose a massive chunk of time when we get to the pit stops. That car with an extra 15 success seconds to serve. Down through the crane as he goes. 24 laps are in the book. But Michael O'Brien, as Andy was making the point earlier on, without having any extra time in the pits, will get the lead back, or should get the lead back, unless something goes awry in the pit, so it becomes a slow stop by a problem. Sam De Haan running there in third place. He's going to give that car over to... Patrick Kuyula, which is going to be uh, another exciting situation to see. Very experienced, very quick driver is Patrick Kuyula. The fit, and up towards Coppice Corner they come. And now Michael O'Brien is having to go defensive. And I still think part of this is the weight telling in the car as that stint is going on. Now, this is how the lead changed. And that's just a bold effort, isn't it? Going through down to the chicane on the outside seemingly from Rob Collard and he's done it. I think O'Brien was on the grass I think coming out of coppice the, and, and couldn't seem to get off the grass so uh, that will explain why he was slow down the straight but uh, Rob Collard really scooting away now as you said 15 extra seconds success seconds added on to Collard uh, and Sandy Mitchell's pitch stop I'll finish that thought in a moment because Sam Dehan looks like he's going to try and throw one up the inside of O'Brien into the Melbourne loop. 
can't do it on the way in. What about the exit speed from Denji Mercedes? Tries to scrabble its way up the hill and can't quite draw himself alongside. Flashing the lights, he's keeping his finger planted on the uh, light flashing button, I think, on the steering wheel. But O'Brien is not being put off by it. He's not, apart from that one little mistake maybe that cost him the lead, he hasn't really put a foot wrong until now. The point I was about to make about the Barber Lamborghini 78, Rob Collard, and uh, Sandy Mitchell, 15 seconds at the moment would drop down into fourth place, but remember to Han in the 69 Mercedes also has a 10 second success penalty to serve. So in essence, the Mercedes will be in the pit lane five seconds less than the Lamborghini. Well, the Lamborghini's already three seconds clear of it. So there's every chance actually, if uh, Collard keeps this pace up and if Tahan can't get past O'Brien quickly, that Collard could still, or Sam Mitchell as it will be then, could still bring the 78 car back out on the podium. Indeed so, as Jordan Witt is now doing good sector time, Sam Dehan is crawling all over the back of Michael O'Brien, determined to go through, up now towards McLean's they come. Uh, it's uh, starting to get interesting in GT4 because the gap is down slightly. Jamie Caroline had an off down at the old hairpin. There is the second and third place battle. Caroline still leads GT4, but Kibble's a bit closer. Not by much, but a little bit closer. So there you've got the two cars, second and third. That McLaren looking a bit more skittish now, which also maybe suggests the road is drying just a touch and the tyres are struggling to uh, maintain temperature. In other words, they're overheating, but on board further back in GT4 with Matt Cowley. He's staring at the back as he has done for a while of the McLaren in the hands of Chris Westmail. Up front, Collard now two and a half seconds to the good. So the lighter Lambo getting away from the McLaren. Uh, yet down into the old hairpin as Dahan is up the inside of O'Brien and he's through into second place now. That's pivotal. Had to do that as quickly as he could to chase after the Rob Collard car. If he stays within five seconds of the 78 Lamborghini, he should come out, or that car should come out of the pit lane ahead of it. The real race for the lead, I guess, in the second half of the race will be car two versus car 18, won't it? The Team Rocket uh, RJN. Um, McLaren of Michael O'Brien and uh, James Baldwin will be racing against Michael Iago and uh, Andrea Calderelli Lamborghini for the lead because neither of those two have success penalties. We had just got Rob Collard done the fastest lap of the race. However, Angus Fender has gone even faster. Uh, Angus Fender is only 21 laps down. However, he has got a very fast car which bodes well for the second race. Huge disappointment for the two seas motorsport team as far as this two R race is concerned but as far as the test session goes then it's looking all right for them and the pace is there now there is Sam Dehan he's up into second place and he's getting away Michael O'Brien did a really good job for I suppose the first what 40 minutes 35 minutes of the race but now that he's lost two places you can see that that McLaren is less easy to drive possibly because of the weight, possibly because the tyres are starting to overheat. It still looks grim and gloomy, but I've got to say the road doesn't look as wet. There isn't as much spray being no. kicked up now, is there? So, although I think there's some moisture still in the air, it's not going to dry rather than wetter. We have to put another lap on uh, Stuart Proctor in the Balfe Motorsport McLaren, still running in 12th position. And there, look, Michael Igo is still closing in on Michael O'Brien. I mean, part of the fact that it must be drying is that you're still getting fastest laps of the race and personal best from certain drivers. So, you know, the road is drying and maybe tyre management is key to all of this. It's still not nice. However, it is uh, a little drier than it was. There is Angus Fender, who looked really impressive when he launched himself onto the SRO Esports Championship at season's end. Unfortunately, he got drilled on the run to the first corner, so we never saw the best of it. But again, here he's illustrating great car speed as the GT4 McLaren 58 now being monstered by number 51 of Duncan Cameron, the Ferrari there with the Irish Green for Matt Griffin, the co-driver. Matt Cowley ahead of them for these two now, as well as needs fourth place. So the Mustang 5.8 seconds behind the podium runners. Uh, but again, they don't have any success penalties to serve. They may yet be a contender for a good result. On board with Patrick Matthias now then. Windscreen wipers still on. More to deal, I think, with the little bit of spray that is still being thrown up uh, by the Pirelli tyres. But uh, yeah, you can see there, it wasn't raining heavily, was it? But the inside of it goes Duncan Cameron running 10th place right now in the Ferrari. The next battle, I think, in GT3 to watch is possibly going to be between Richard Neary and Jordan Witt, because Jordan Witt has been catching Neary for eighth position, and uh, those two, of course, uh, had an incident that was being investigated earlier on. They came close to contact coming out of Redgate, and they're getting themselves back together again. So dare I say it, then, things starting to calm down a bit now. Good job, we've got pit stops coming up inside the next 10 minutes just to, to throw an extra spanner in the works. Indeed so, and I wonder what people are thinking tyre-wise at the moment. There is Duncan Cameron to have a look at the inside. Bear in mind as well, this is a monster day for the teams because at the end of a two-hour race, they've got about two hours to turn everything around for a one-hour race later on. So 
Uh, the reason for this is because, of course, we have lost one date off the calendar of Spa, which was meant to be in mid-July, but just wasn't feasible to travel at the time. So it's become six events, not seven, and the track time of the two-hour race that you would have had there has been brought into this event. So uh, the drivers over the course of the season still get the mileage that they signed up for. However, as far as the teams are concerned, this is one of those days that by the end of it, they'll know they did the day at a racetrack. Duncan Cameron on the tail of Matt Cowley. They're on different laps, so Cameron is 10th a lap up on the 16th place Matt Cowley Mustang. Uh, Sam Dehan at the front, by the way, lapping quicker than Rob Pollard. The gap's coming down now again by seven tenths on the previous lap. Dehan, uh, to emphasise your point about drivers continuing to get quick, and that was a personal best lap for the, uh, the driver in second place. I just want to go back to the point you were making then about the amount of track time they've got today, and I was talking to... Joe Osborne, who is a uh, regular commentator these days on the Intelligent Money, Money British GT Championship team, but he's back behind the uh, wheel this weekend, racing the 36 Valve Motorsport. You can't take that over from Stuart Proctor imminently. Uh, and he was saying that, yes, this is very taxing on all of the drivers, especially the AM drivers. And you think, why? Well, it's three hours of racing. We have a three-hour race at Silverstone every year. But the trouble is, this is split over two races, so the adrenaline keeps you going through the two-hour race and through your one-hour stint in that two-hour race. And then you sit around and do nothing for a while, and uh, you end up, the adrenaline goes down, and when it comes around to the second race, the energy levels maybe aren't quite as high as, uh, as you'd like them to be. So, yeah, it's, it's a unique format, this. We haven't seen this before, certainly not in recent memory in the championship, and it throws up uh, an extra few challenges for the teams and drivers to deal with. Because even though the situation will be similar for the AMs starting race one, finishing race two, they'll have done more driving time in this because they get the best part of an hour uh, for the, or just over, for the opening stint. Now, Jordan Witt still looking very, very quick, number 10, uh, McLaren, because he's done an absolute best in the first sector. Angus Fender, number nine, McLaren here. I mean, forget his overall position, really. That car now is worth watching only for his lap times rather than anything else. He will give it over to Dean McDonald, who put it in the gravel early in FP1 yesterday, brought out a red flag. But Dean McDonald will do the second stint in what is shaping up to be a very quick car, but he may not even be classified as a finisher, given that it's so many laps behind. Up towards the timing line they go. Now, we are give or take a few seconds, eight minutes off GT4 pit stops. So again, if the quicker driver is to go second, you can expect those cars to be in right at the start of the available time for them. The leading gap is 2.9 seconds, and last time, again, Sam Dehan, there he is, quicker than was Rob Collard. It's going to be Patrick Cuyola to take that car over, who is less familiar with a Mercedes than Sandy Mitchell is a Lamborghini. Sandy will take over from Rob Collard. Sandy having raced in the GT World Challenge Endurance Cup in Europe last year and in Super Trofeo North America, uh, while both in the States, and also had a win at uh, Jerez in the final round of the uh, championship and the World Finals. So an experienced Lamborghini peddler is the quick spot, Sandy Mitchell. He will take over the leading car. But where else do we need to be looking? Because fourth, fifth, sixth, they've lost so much time, haven't they, relative to the top three. It's going to be interesting to see what pans out in the second stint. Sam Dehan flinging the car through the S's there. He's on it. I mean, he's doing his level best to negate any deficit to that Lamborghini before the pit window. And it's working. He's under three seconds behind now. So at this rate, the order all being equal after the pit stop should be two from 18 and then 69 ahead of 78. That should be the top four. And the fascination there is the two car like O'Brien in it now. That will be taken over by another silver-graded driver, James Baldwin, in his first wet British GT race, of course, and only his third ever race in the championship. And right, right behind him, well, not far behind him, only three or so seconds right now, would be Andrea Calderelli, a factory Lamborghini uh, driver, a pro driver, of course. So, in theory, the leader should not be as quick as the second-place car, and they're not going to be that far ahead now of Collard and Dehan, because they have managed to pull a gap uh, over those that won't be serving penalties. That's the theory, and uh, we'll see how it all pans out in the second stint. There's an incident that was between uh, Ian Loggy and Jamie Caroline under investigation, so GT3 on GT4, which suggests a clash during Lappery, doesn't it? There is number six Mercedes, that's uh, the car of Ian Loggy in sixth position, Yelma Berman to get behind the wheel of that, and then you just like the blue touch paper and stand back, don't you? Yelma Berman, always a hugely exciting driver to watch, and they are chasing currently the Adam Ballon, Phil Key, Lamborghini. Phil, of course, part of Lamborghini's factory programme, so you've got two real star drivers to take over these cars, and they are separated by fractions of a second. In GT4, 
we still have the TF Sport 1 2, and that is. Oh, you, sorry, you got there first. Yeah, Jordan Witt, all right, I won't tell you. Uh, having another drama, this time at Redgate Corner. It's not been his day, has it? Uh, and, and, and the frustration is that he is a very talented GT driver. I've seen him racing not only the McLaren this year, but Bentley's in other GT competition and winning races on a regular basis. He's a quick driver, some Porsche experience as well, of course. Uh, for some reason, this weekend, it's not clicking. Whereas at Alton Park, he's one of the fastest drivers in his class. So, uh, different circuit, different conditions, of course. And uh, uh, we know that the, the weight of uh, some of the McLarens has been changed as well. But uh, for one reason or another, Jordan Witt has been struggling as here Ian Loggy finally might have got past Adam Ballon. He's been trying this for the best part of half an hour. He's got the inside line on the Lamborghini. They're going to lean on each other. At least they're both green and green and black, I suppose. You won't be able to notice the scuff mark so uh, easily if they do make contact. Thankfully, they avoid it. The Mercedes goes through, but there's damage on the nose. Has he been into the back of somebody? Possibly the Lamborghini. The bonnet is starting to peel up. Don't forget, he's under investigation ah, yes. the incident with 97 Aston. Yeah. So maybe it's a legacy of that. Might not be, but it might be a legacy of that. And I'd be fearful about that. It's yeah. a good job it's a left hooker. But the danger now is the air gets under that and rips that asunder. Now, he's got to go for another six minutes so let's call it three laps like that with the risk of damage well and if he gets given the black and orange meatball flag i think he has three laps does he not to come in and serve that so if he, if he can get another lap before he gets warned for it he might in theory be able to stretch into the pit stop window but is that sensible if the bonnet flips up and does damage to the car they could be out of the race altogether if it is a legacy of contact with another car i'm surprised because there's no other witness mark around but you know you'd expect the bodywork to be a bit crumpled that purely looks like a bonnet pin has broken I struggling to see where else there might be damage around that front right corner however when it stops at the pits we'll possibly get a closer look but it doesn't look as though it's been mauled particularly around the, the corner it could just be a bonnet pin that's somehow broken however either way it's interesting that having got ahead of uh, Adam Ballant he's storming clear despite the peril of the bonnet now he's got a GT3 McLaren to negotiate which is uh, Stuart Proctor Proctor Senior dry line there through the chicane yeah, isn't it pretty much so uh, you made the point earlier on it's uh, one line through there so I suppose it will dry out quicker but that does rather prove your theory that conditions are improving and the last lap we had six people do a personal best I know the cars are lighter but even so the track conditions are improving so do you stretch this stint then leave your slower driver in for longer in the hope you can stick it on slicks later in the race because as you said there's no window as such if it were to dry out in another 20 minutes I don't know, I'm sure some of the teams are considering it at damage to the back of the 97 Aston Martin, by the way, the um, class leaders in GT4, so uh, the plot thickens there. I think it's... The evidence is, is stacking up, isn't yes. it? Yes. Right, is that Angus Fender in? Yes, it is. It's not a scheduled pit stop as such. No, very scheduled. It's a fairly leisured pit stop as well. Yeah, but like I say, this is, is now a test session, so it might be that they have done what they needed to do on that programme. They might send it back out with Dean McDonald behind the wheel a little bit later to give him some mileage in readiness for race two. Sam De Haan, fastest lap of the race last time. Lead gap, though, is up to three seconds. So number nine's pit stop is effectively an academic one. Critically now, Rob Collard is 17 seconds ahead of Michael Igo. So as it stands, that car, 78 car, would actually come out third after the pit stops with its 15 second penalty rather than fourth. So Collard putting in a demon second half of the stint here. Ever since he took the lead, he and Zahad have been the two quickest cars on the track. And right now, the black car of Lamborghini would come out in front of this WPI example, especially if Michael Igo keeps making mistakes like that. Uh, number nine had a problem with the door. That's why it was uh, in the pit lane. So having conflagrated it's then got a door issue and that car has uh, pitted as a consequence so it's back on track as the test session continues uh, now you're asking a question earlier do you stretch this stint for your slower driver or see how far you can go before you put your, your gun in and see if you can change on the slick tires i'd still do it at the start at, at the available time because the more time you have your quick driver oh. in the better that is out of ballon off the road so that cost that car a chance of a good result, he fishtails his way back onto the circuit, losing places, hand over fist. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Goes for the wet part of the road. I wonder whether they're going to gamble and put cars on slicks at the pit stop because there's the second part of the incident, obviously outbreaking and going straight on. But as soon as he got himself off the grass, he went for the wet part of the road to look after the tyres. So the, there are teams, I suspect, maybe those towards the bottom end of the top six that may roll the dice. Brave pro driver, earn your money. 
on see. cold, slick tyres on what is still definitely a damp racetrack and, and a particularly slippery one as well. The uh, close proximity to the East Midlands Airport, uh, the theory goes at least, means that this place gets a bit slicker in the wet than some other racetracks do. And, uh, well, yes, I think if it was the AMs getting in, they wouldn't even consider that. But given the fact, as you quite rightly said, it's the pros getting in, uh, at least in the pro-am cars, for the second half of the race, that uh, it could happen. And, of course, that your driver lineup rather determines to an extent what your strategy can be. If you're a silver cup entrant, you might not be as confident in putting your second driver out there on slick tyres in these conditions. There are so many options, there are so many different ways to skin this particular cat, aren't they? And, and we don't know at this stage what the right thing to do is, because of course you can go out there on slicks and then five minutes later, it starts raining again. That's exactly right. And you'll need a good few laps to get them up to temperature, yeah. so they wouldn't work instantly, because as you say, it is still damp, but have we got to that tipping point yet between wet to working and dry as well? They're in the pit lane on the GT4 teams because at 58 minutes you can pit and that is exactly what uh, the BMW has done there for the driver change, the Century Motorsport car for Ben Hurst, the Canadian to give way to Andrew Gordon Colbrook. Other teams await their cars too. With wet tyres there for HHC, so they've made their minds up on the yeah. Indeed so. Indeed so. Probably it's still the way to go, but it wouldn't surprise me if you didn't have one brave team that rolled the dice. So it's a full service, this. It's driver, fuel, and tyres. 58 there, Patrick Matisse to give way in his car to Jordan Collard, one of Rob's two racing sons. Of course, the Collard's good racing family go back to Rob's late father, Mick Collard, Duffy Collard, world hot rod champion and uh, legend of oval racing. Michael O'Brien, another second generation racer. His dad from single seaters and the British Touring Car Championship. Remember him and his Holden Commodore, Mike O'Brien, in the late 80s. He's third, Michael, at the moment, going up towards the right hander of Coppice. And O'Brien is now 12 seconds behind Rob Collard. If Collard can find another three seconds before the pit stop, he'll come out second after the stop. So, this again, I suppose we're seeing the advantage here of a silver grade driver against an AM, maybe. They've kept the tyres alive longer, they're getting quicker as the stint goes on, and they're pulling further ahead. So, uh, add that as an extra dynamic into this battle and the fascination continues. Jerry Caroline staying out a bit longer in the class leading uh, GT4 Aston Martin. You saw the Speedworks Toyota in for its pit stop. There is 97 there, Jamie Caroline doing at least one more of that before he gives way to Ooh. former Radical racer, former Carrera Cup racer Dan Gore. Hooks a wheel over the curb out of Redgate, but there's no real drama in all of that. He corrects all of that. Motors away down through the Kramer curves as 58 is set to rejoin the race as we get now into the second hour and therefore in 17 seconds time 16 15 you can anticipate the gt3 cars coming through now where are the lower gt3 runners because you've just had michael o'brien over the line michael igo will do one more lap but it could be the loggy proctor ballon well loggy's gone by now you can pit so if you're a gt3 driver at the back of the train you could dive in on this lap the leading gap is 2.3 seconds it came down by a second and a half last time looking for our first gt3 pit stop we're not there yet but yes we are adam ballon is in so remember he had his off adam ballon this could be crucial gives way first of all to phil key 20 second success penalty here though because they're our most recent gt3 winners they won that uh, second race at, uh, at alton park having finished seventh in race one they are second in the championship coming to donnington park where they've had no luck at all in recent years when donnington has traditionally hosted the final round of the championship of course this year that honor goes to the silverstone circuit with the silverstone 500. i can't wait for that three hours in the lovely <laughs> autumnal weather stroke freezing cold uh, fastest lap of the race 141.5 for jordan witt so when he goes he goes well so jordan witt again light fuel load in that car but he has done the fastest lap of the race now we've had as we've said adam, ba adam ballon into the pit lane is rob collard going to stay out for one more lap he might if he's not careful here be forced to if he gets himself on the outside line of nick jones bentley he's Which gonna have has. to go around again well the bentley pits then so nick jones in to give way and so also sam the Hart. now this again is going to be very interesting indeed because that's giving the quick cooler one extra lap over sandy mitchell 10 second success penalty here for tahan for tahan which is five seconds less than the 78 lamborghini and he was 3.6 seconds back when they came in so this could be the car that emerges with the race lead but as you say it will be patrick cooler in the car michael o'brien is into 
hand over the uh, Jensen Team Rocket RJN McLaren to uh, James Baldwin. And uh, as the McLaren heads into the pit lane, pit lane, a very busy place because there is still a bit of overlapping here, I think, with GT4 and GT3 pit stops. Speaking of GT4, the race leader coming past a battle for position, is that? No, 95 uh, is Patrick Kibble. And uh, the 58 McLaren in front is Jordan Collard having made a pit stop. So they're on different laps. But that was a busy bit of racetrack for Rob Collard. And on what could be his in-lap, that might have cost him another second. That could make all the difference. Thankfully, his son got out of the way, didn't he? Because yes. 58 is now Jordan Collard. Yeah. Woe betide you, Jordan, if you get in Dad's way when he's trying to get to the pit lane in a big, big hurry. No pocket money if you do that. So uh, through goes Rob Collard then. And he is still the race leader. You've got to say, having been in single driver relatively underpowered two litre touring cars forever and a day he's adapting to gt cars very very well isn't he and uh, rob a, a, a really feisty racer he's been a great part of the british touring car championship for many many years and i think he'll be a great part of british gt for many years to come as well so he leads but his pit stop is imminent de Haan is in o'brien is in Igo is in that is about to be scott mulvan ready to blast away in the immaculate team parker racing bentley Stuart Parker's teams had a really busy schedule. They run in this, they run in the BTCC, they run in World Challenge Europe, and they run in Carrera Cup GB. Stuart doesn't know whether he's coming or going or whether he's been. Off the road is McLaren from two Cs. It's either nine or ten. Where are you going to put your money? I fear it might be Jordan Witt again. Uh, Jordan this Witt time it's Jordan Witt's Fender, yes. So yeah. Angus Fender off the road this time, just for variety. <laughs> Not Jack guilty this time. Indeed, Jordan. yes. Right, wrongly accused. That's going to be Jack Mitchell to take over. And Collard staying out for another lap, interestingly. His pace is good, and he's a silver-graded driver, remember, so he's not going to lose as much time to the uh, gold and platinum-graded pros as they jump in. Out goes Baldwin ahead of Sander, uh, Patrick Kuyula, interestingly. I thought Kuyula might uh, manage to um, stay ahead with his success penalty of the McLaren, so this could be the fight for the race lead once the pit stops are all done. And somewhere into all of this uh, will emerge Sandy Mitchell in the 78 bar while Lamborghini, when Rob Collard decided to give him a Go. Kuyla did not waste any time getting past James Baldwin. James, oh. on his first wet racing lap in the championship, lasted four corners before the Mercedes went through. Oh, that's so far. Kuyla off the road because he ran very deep, didn't he, into the old hairpin, but he gets away with it. Kuyla, who made a name for himself in Lamborghini Super Trofeo, now having to adapt to a different type of GT3 car. Arguably, it's a good career move because it doesn't stereotype him anymore. It's just a Lamborghini specialist. He's driven for Barwell in, uh, and still does, in... in uh, World Challenge Europe in, super, in, in Lamborghini equipment, but now for Dan Shufflebottom's Ram Racing Squad with Sam Bahar. Richard Neary is in to give way to Sam Sam. Quite a lot of father and son, some family affairs in the championship this year. There is one significant one, Rob Collard. Is he going to come in this time? No. No. OK, well, he's very happy out there, clearly. I've got the radio's broken, but uh, Rob Collard flashing his lights at the 97 car of... Jamie Caroline, who also has not pitted yet from the lead of GT4, interestingly. There are a handful, about half of the GT4 cars, including the pair of TF Sport Aston Martins, yet to make their stop. What's going to be interesting, though, is to see if and when we get a lap from a GT3 car that it's better than a 141 and a half, because that's the fastest lap of the race. And as soon as people start going quicker than that in this stint, then you know how much faster it's going to be. And that's perhaps the tipping point. The road's still looking an awful lot drier than it was earlier on. Assuming they're all on wet tyres, I just wonder whether we're going to have a tyre preservation element to the last 10 laps, 10 minutes of the race, because if you're on wet and it's getting drier all the time now, and it looks a touch brighter to me, I think tyre preservation is going to be very, very important indeed. And if you're going to try and make the slick gamble and leave the car out longer in this stint, you'd, you'd do it with a silver drive, wouldn't you? Because as I say, they're not losing as much time to the pros as an Amwood, so maybe that's the plan here for Barwell. They've got two cars as well and they're both running in different classes in a way. You've got the silver car here, 78, 72 and Pro-Am. They can maybe try two different strategies here. Ballard obviously had the uh, pit stop uh, penalty to serve before he handed over to Phil Keane. Might they try and get the 78 car to make one pit stop less than the others or get out there on the right tyre at the right time should it dry out? Always trying to do a pit stop less, absolutely, is the answer to that. And let's see. I mean, Rob Collard, he's not, is he hunting for the wet patch? He's not particularly. He's going for the line. But it'd be interesting if we can look at the pit stop and see what they do for tyres. And is it going to be this lap? No. No, another one done. So that's going to give... 
48 minutes at best to uh, Sandy Mitchell. I was chuckling in the background because Patrick Cuyolo has only done a lap. He's already had a track limits warning. Uh, we saw him run wide at the old hairpin. So that's where one of the pressure pads is at an MSB circuit. They have these and they're at the old hairpin at Donington Park. So uh, straight away, he uh, was given a warning. And also, he has done an absolute best in the middle sector. So now that they're getting into a rhythm, remember the cars are much heavier now than they were at the end of the previous stint. Track um, limits are being observed by all the officials. The entire temperatures and pressures are coming up. But Kuyula has just done the fastest lap of the race, nearly three tenths quicker than Jordan Witt. Yes, so they are now starting to lose time then, our Barwell here, and Optimum as well. They've kept Lewis Proctor out in second place. Side by side here, that is Phil Keane up the inside of Jack Mitchell. That is the position because of Keane's penalty, remember, uh, for the win at Alton. So that is now for ninth place overall, uh, with a couple of others still to shake out, I think, after their pit stop. So one Bar Barwell machine starting to make progress again. I really do think they're playing the strategy game here with Collard and indeed with Proctor at the front. They've stayed out now a lot longer than arguably they should have done, I think, uh, to uh, because they are now starting to hemorrhage time. I mean, Rob Collard's lap time there, a 142.3, over a second slower than Kuyala in the 69 Mercedes, with whom they were expecting to be fighting for maybe a race win. I think Barwell have decided the only way they're going to win this race is if they try something different. They've left him out this long, they might as well try and hedge their bets with the weather. Well, that's 57, which is in for HHC. And Rob Collard stays out for another lap as the road dries a fraction. So it's a roll of the dice. He's losing over a second a lap, or was losing over a second. That was actually quicker. So he was in the 43s. When traffic permits, Rob is back into the 41s. But net, the gap is coming down. Collard's cooler. However, if they can get this car on slicks relative to the wet shot Mercedes that may have to make another stop, it could pan out in their favour. But of course, the other problem in all of this is they're going to lose 15 seconds in the pit stop any time. Uh, they haven't yet got the tyres on the pit apron, so I think there's an element here of not wanting to show their hands either. Mark Leather's team, Barwell Motorsport, hugely experienced. Mark Racer himself, he'll know exactly what the score is. So it's going to be really interesting, this. The lead gap is coming down. It's going to be a much longer pit stop. If it's the right tyre choice, is it going to be a win? As you see there, Patrick Kuyala monstering his way through the traffic. He's going to be wide again at the old hairpin, but he manages to put a lap on a somewhat startled 95, which is still Patrick Kibble, who is glued into the TF Anston. Stuart Proctor, by the way, is still out in the Balfe Motorsport McLaren. I reckon they're rolling the dice because you would imagine, with respect to Stuart, you'd want to get Joe Osborne into that car as quickly as possible. He was fastest in the pro qualifying session yesterday, so the fact they're not sticking him in straight away tells me again they're going to try and stretch this. Yelma Berman now does the fastest lap down in seventh place in car number six for round racing on 40 now, 0 0.660, but he is that little bit further off the lead pack again uh, as they, uh, no, they didn't have a pit stop penalty, did they? They just slipped back in the first stint. Calderelli's in for Igo. Uh, the other one to watch, Lewis Proctor staying out, it's like his dad, uh, and that's going to be given over to Ollie Wilkinson, who has developed into a very, very rapid McLaren driver indeed in a short space of time. So Rob Collard has done another lap, incidentally. There, the teams are getting ready. They've got the fuel hoses, they've got tyres ready. There are drivers waiting for a stint. This is Jamie Caroline coming through. He's going to give the Aston over eventually to Dan Vaughan, but not this time. You're not meant to do the entire two hours, but I don't think there's a, a minimum on how much you can drive. So through goes Jamie Caroline then, and as Andy said, we're now into the one minute forces as the best lap by Yelma Berman. I'm loving this. This is fascinating. It's Absolutely. the kind of strategic battle that we don't often see in this championship, and, and, and you know the racing is usually more than exciting enough to make up for that. But this, the, the unique conditions, the format of the race, the weather conditions out there. That is really adding a, a fascinating dynamic to this, and Patrick Kuyla just cannot get a clean run at the old hairpin, can he? That is Jamie Caroline, the GT4 leader in front of him, who in turn is trying to drive through the 57 McLaren, uh, which is a lap down, because Bowers now in that car, Caroline takes to the grass going through Starkey there. Those two cars not on the same lap. The Aston Martin is a lap ahead of the HHC McLaren, but owes us a pit stop. Bowers drifts out wide. He's not making life easy here for Caroline, who goes up the inside. It almost looked as though Bowers was going... He is trying to squeeze Caroline as they go towards Coppice, but Jamie should be able to elbow his way through, more pushing and shoving between the two of them. It's all right, the back of the Aston Martin's damaged already. It is indeed, the diffusers on the ground. I was about to say Phil Keane has done the fastest lap of the race, but that could be significant as far as the GT4 leader is concerned. Jamie Caroline just getting the back swipes by the McLaren look as they come then now down to the S's. 
and are we going to see a race leading car return to the circuit it won't be the leading car because of its longer pit stop but on slick tires another lap done by rob collard then he's done 42 laps here so it's probably the longest time he's driven probably in his racing life because touring car races are normally over within at least half an hour this is the replay of jamie caroline getting up alongside gus bowers now that mclaren tries to slot back in but there just wasn't really the room for it so as he tucked in behind he just swipes the back of the aston martin not deliberate i don't believe but it did do some damage rob collard however is still there still leading now he is lapping 2.2 seconds a lap slower than Phil Keane's Lamborghini. The danger now is, of course, as we watch here, a fight between uh, James Baldwin and Andrea Caldarelli for fourth place. This shouldn't be the hardest overtake Caldarelli's ever had to make, but he's making it hard for himself, going around the outside through Hollywood. They're stuck behind. Pat 57, Gus Bowers, driven McLaren, and, I, and uh, Caldarelli goes through. Uh, bear in mind, James Baldwin is the only one of those two that's raced here before. Yes. Andrea Caldarelli <laughs> hasn't. James Baldwin has. Oh. In FF 1600, and they've not given up yet because the Lamborghini up the curb just about staying ahead. Gus Bowers, of course, who is uh, trying to keep these lap times as good as he can in GT4, eventually has to let them go. But there's so much more that's going to shake out of all of this with still three quarters of an hour to go. And it's James Baldwin that gets roughed up in terms of the traffic. He was sent the wrong way there. Loses time. And Andrea Caldarelli, for the moment at least, scarpers ahead. James Baldwin finding uh, the GT4 McLaren a tough enough to crack. Right. Uh, Rob, if you're coming in, it's that slip road on the left. On, on the left. All right, OK, you do another lap then. That's going to be 43 in the book for him. This is remarkable stuff, isn't it? Calderelli there moving into fourth overall. He's now second of those that have stopped. He's going to be about eight seconds behind Kuyla. So that will be the fight for the lead. Once Rob Collard and Lewis Proctor eventually decide they're going to bring the car into the pit lane and give their teammate a go. Uh, but if they do come out on slick tyres, they should be quicker and they might just be able to catch up again. So uh, we're, sort of, we're doing a lot of anticipating here, aren't we? Because we're kind of trying to uh, work out how this will unfold. Uh, Phil Keane, by the way, continuing to go quicker at 40.0 now. Just to give you reference, by the way, the pole position time um, in GT3, the fastest time we saw in GT3 in qualifying yesterday, 27.0. They're only about 13 seconds off a low-fuel, slick-tyre, dry-track qualifying run, and they're on wet tyres on a, on a damp but drying track. So I don't know what the crossover point is. The teams, I'm sure, will have that information, and they will know that as soon as the lap times for those on wet tyres get down to, say, a 1.38 or a 139, that that is the point that the slick tyre would be quicker. And Barwell, let's face it, they know what they're doing. They've won one or two of these races. They are a very successful GT and endurance racing squad. They know how to put together a quick car and a quick strategy. Rob Collard has just done his fastest lap of the race. Not the fastest, but a personal best lap. So maybe that's his last hurrah. Say, so, all right, go on. I'll come in next time then. So I'll go on a high. It's been a remarkable stint by Rob Collard. I mean, he's certainly a fit guy. He's run the London Marathon innumerable times, uh, once for nothing in terms of fitness. But don't forget, he's new to the discipline, relatively new to the car, having done uh, World Challenger at British GT. No, he's not coming in, is he? He's going to carry on for another lap. Sandy Mitchell can carry on having a nap, waiting for his stint. So Rob Collard still leads the way, and it can only be that they're trying to get this to the, uh, the, the driest point. But looking across, I've got spectators in front of me with umbrellas back up again. And I just wonder whether it's not starting to look a little bit gloomier. What do you think? It's so hard to tell because it's been gloomy from the start, but it's, it's just low cloud, isn't it? It's not really rain. There's moisture in the air, but the track generally has been getting drier rather than wetter. I mean, that kills this strategy. If it rains, they're done for, and they are now preparing for a pit stop with grooved, wet Pirelli tyres on standby. But of course, just out of shot in the garage, there could be a set of Pirelli slicks waiting just in case. Good indeed, and they might still be used towards the end. You know, yeah. if it does suddenly stop raining and dries out, the leaders are... This is the GT4 leader coming in. This is the Jamie Caroline car to give way now to Dan Ford. And Rob Collard is on his 45th lap. I wonder if you're right and it started raining and the teams have thought, you know what, this isn't going to work. If it rains now, it'll never dry out again, yeah. even if it stops five minutes later. That's maybe why we're seeing a flurry of activity again, the GT4 leader in, and maybe we can anticipate the GT3 leader in this time too. But I fear in that case, if it has started raining again, as you see there, Patrick Kuyla in traffic, that will have done 478's chances yeah. because it was losing time against this car anyway, plus it's going to have a longer pit stop and there'll be less time in the race for Sandy Mitchell to come back. Uh, amazingly, we've 
have not had a car in real strife, have we? Despite the conditions, with the exception of the late starting McLaren, everybody has been able to survive. We've had one or two off the road. I know I'm tempted to fade say this. <laughs> However, um, they've got away with it. And there is Rob Collard, who is heading for the pit lane. Finally, he's in. Sandy Mitchell is ready. And surely it is going to be wet now, as we fear. Yeah, I think so. Looks... Yes, it is. Yeah, group wet tyres, the Pirelli wet. Well, it was a good stint, it was a good roll on the dice. It's probably not going to work out in their favour. However, who knows what could happen in 41 minutes. Exactly, we could get a safety car, it could suddenly start drying out again. Who knows, if we get a safety car, pit stop under a safety car costs you less time, of course. And we still have almost half race to go, essentially 40 minutes still to go in this uh, two-hour third round of the Intelligent Body British GT Championship. If you have a safety car and you're on wet, so you're not taking the same life out of them because no. you're not stressing them. You can go for the wet part, you might be able to get away without a pit stop. However... All that presupposes we get a safety car. <laughs> yes. Where's the magic button to trigger one? <laughs> um, Peter Daly, the race director, I think, is in charge of that. But he's not going to trigger it for the sake of it, that is for sure. Right, there is a very definite wet tyre. The Barwell mechanics good to go. Optimum in as well. For right. Second. Indeed, there it is. The proper uh, orange of McLaren for the Lewis Proctor and Ollie Wilkinson car. Well, it's going to be an intriguing second part of the race in both classes. Another car that we haven't really got too excited about yet, but will do in terms of lap time surely is the 51 Ferrari. I have to confess to being a Matt Griffin fan, any time you put Matt into a Ferrari, it just comes alive. Uh, he only knows one way to go and it's flat out. Very rarely makes mistakes. That car could also be gaining places before the end. So, 96 is refuelled. There, 78, of course, cars have to be sanitised as well within the pit stop. The uh, incoming driver gives something a little wipe down to make sure that the working area for him is COVID friendly this is the car that will inherit the lead then Patrick Kuyula having taken over from Sam Dehan Calderelli 1.7 seconds quicker than Kuyula last time the gap is under 10 seconds now which means what effectively will be the lead two cars although it will be closer than I expected actually right down the pit lane goes the leading Lamborghini yes they get out in front is he it's going to be touch and go but that was a surprisingly quick stop for the Lamborghini, but it is going to be a change for the race lead. There is Patrick Cuyola who will go through, and he puts another lap on Dean McDonald's McLaren in the process. Now, Sandy Mitchell is in second place. And where in all of this is Andrea Calderelli going to be? We'll monitor gaps at the end of this lap, but Sandy Mitchell storms through. Now, the pit stops, of course, are timed, pit in to pit out. So if there are any discrepancies, once everybody has made a pit stop, the race officials will be notified and action will be taken accordingly. I'm not suggesting anybody has done anything wrong on pit stops. I'm merely illustrating that um, the data is there and it's pretty irrefutable. Now, of course, these tyres on the 78 car are about... 20 minutes fresher than the tyres on the 69 uh, Mercedes. The Mercedes has a silver graded driver as well. So they're both silver graded drivers, but the tyres on the Lamborghini are fresher and the Lamborghini was every bit as quick as the Mercedes in the first part of the stint. Now, OK, they haven't been able to work work it to get the car on slick tyres, uh, but they have got fresher wet tyres, so they might still have a shot at this yet because they came out a lot closer to the leaders than we expected. It's true enough. Yep. So... They'll also be on a different fuel load, of course, having gone into the race but now heavier than the cars that pitted earlier and took on the fuel. Joe Osborne will take over this McLaren. That means everybody now will have made a stop. So we'll do the order, we'll do the gaps at the end of the next lap with only 37 minutes on the clock. Up towards the timing line, it will be 69 Mercedes that should now inherit the race lead there. Patrick Cuyola does go through and... Where is Sandy Mitchell? He's only four seconds back. And closed significantly in the final sector by about six or seven tenths. Those fresher tyres, maybe they're going to be enough to bring them back in. The, the, the starting point then is 4.4 seconds. Wheeler back to Mitchell. Add into this though, Patrick, uh, Andrea Caldarelli, a pro driver, closing on the pair of them. Car 78's pit stop is uh. under investigation. So we're trying to work out why the gap is so slender. So a race control. Car 78 pit stop is under investigation. It doesn't necessarily mean they've done something wrong, but race control like us have noticed, I think, haven't they, that they came out further up than we anticipated they will. They were, and they will now uh, investigate it. Of course, you made the point about fuel. They will have had to put less fuel in this car because they pitted it later. 
maybe they've miscalculated because they've spent less time fueling the car. They've got the pit stop done quicker and they've released it too quickly. I mean, they should still have someone there with a stop on surely timing it, but mistakes can happen, especially under pressure. That car should have served an extra 15 seconds in the pits. Now, TSL's data times it from pit in loop to pit out. The race director has given a piece of paper with everybody's pit stop time and anything that is under what it should be is an alert. It could be something else, but we have a stop-go penalty for number eight, we understand, uh, for a pit lane infringement. The team manager was being asked to ring the race director, so a pit lane infringement is different from a pit lane time drama. However, we'll worry about the Mercedes in due course because right now, Sandy Mitchell is finding the traffic that Patrick Cuyola found a lap ago. That's why the gap came down in the last sector, because all of this traffic was doing no favours to the car ahead. Now the gap... 3.9 as they cross the line, but still trying to work his way through is Sandy Mitchell. 10 seconds stop go for car number eight. Uh, yes, so uh, we'll try and find out what that's for. Uh, 78, by the way, that's being investigated after the race, apparently, the pit stop infringement uh, for Volvo. So for now, we have a genuine race on the road. My tip here is Calderelli, though. Six seconds now off the lead, two and a bit seconds quicker than the lead. Now, OK, the lead has had some traffic. But Calderelli should be quicker than the pair of them. The leader is not as quick as the second place car. The second place car is not as quick as the third place car. We've got a real race on our hands with 35 minutes left. Absolutely right. There is Calderelli making his Donington debut there, working his way through the traffic. And the traffic is key to all of this with 35 minutes still to go. What else have we got further back in terms of people looking quick? Well, also rapid is Yelma Berman, uh, who is lapping faster than Cuyler and Mitchell. But I think the traffic is key to all of this because there's that wall of cars. If it's a, an independent car on its own that you have to pick past, it's a bit different. But getting through a whole battle pack is very different indeed. In GT4, by the way, Academy Motorsport have inherited, inherited the lead. Jordan Albert, uh, although we're waiting, maybe I think he's on an outlap, actually. I'll give, get back to that in a moment. Yeah. Conor O'Brien might possibly get the 95 car in front. The car that definitely isn't leading GT4 anymore, though, is 97, with Dan Vaughan now on board. Jamie Caroline pitted later, and they had a success penalty to serve, uh, and they have uh, dropped down at least to second, possibly to third in class, as we watch Phil Keane, who still has the fastest lap, uh, and is lapping <laughs> a 1 minute 40.9, is quicker than everyone other than Calderelli. So if you want to see quick GT3 cars, look for a Lamborghini, because uh, Calderelli is flying, Keane is flying as well, uh, Sandy Mitchell is not, however, that time a 143.5. He's only a second ahead of Calderelli. That's why, though, he had to lap the 51 Ferrari and the number 9 2Cs Motorsport McLaren, which now Calderelli has to do, and they're not exactly leaping out of his way. Matt Griffin's leaping out of the way in the Ferrari, suggesting he might have a problem there. Matt Griffin uh, still struggling down in 10th place. So Andrea Calderelli may be new to Donington, may be new to this team, but he knows all about Lamborghinis. We've got an incident involving uh, the Adam Ball and Phil Keane Lamborghini and 96, the optimum Proctor Wilkinson McLaren uh, under investigation. But Andrea Calderelli and a Lamborghini just fit. You know, he's had so much success in Europe with the Calderelli and Lamborghini. It's a bit like strawberries and cream or motor racing commentators and magnetic sexual attraction. I mean, he's absolutely <laughs> the right fit for that car. He may not know the circuit, but he's learning fast and he is absolutely storming along, as Andy rightly says. Certainly, second place he's on. But what about Kuyla? Because he's got to make up seven seconds. Part of that is going to be how long it takes him to catch Mitchell and get past him. And of course, Sandy's not going to let him go, is he? He's going to put up as stoic a defence as he possibly can. Yeah, they may both be in Lamborghinis, but they're run by separate teams. And uh, OK, Calderelli's a factory Lamborghini driver, but WPI Motorsport desperately need a good result here. They came out of Alton Park with only an 11th and a 9th place finish uh, to show, and they came into the season as arguably one of the championship favourites. They had great pace uh, last season. They really surprised us when they uh, kind of joined in the championship after the first round, immediately on the pace of Michael Igo and Dennis Lind. Alton Park was disappointing. They had a great problem in qualifying, put them right at the back of the grid, and they just couldn't work their way back towards the front. So they need to capitalise on the fact they didn't have a success penalty here. They've got a quick car, they've got a quick pair of drivers, and they've got a shot at the race win. They have to clear the 78 Lamborghini quickly, though, Otherwise, they're not going to have time to get to the leader, who was actually quicker than them last time. Kuyala did a 41-0 in the lead. Sandy Mitchell in second did a 140.9, so a couple of tenths quicker. And then it was 141.2 for Calderelli. Traffic, of course, had uh, something to do with that, but he was the slowest of the leading three that time, and the only one actually not to set a personal best lap time. Yeah, so that gap just stretching ever so slightly. Yes, and uh, Calderelli is... 
pushing on. He's got some clear track now, so let's watch the sectors. Well, he's going quicker now, but not as quick as Yelma Berman in fourth place, who sets the fastest first sector of the race so far. Conditions are definitely starting to improve again here, I think. Uh, Sam Neary is in the pit lane to serve his penalty, so Sam will drop the Team Abba Racing car, possibly outside of the top ten with that. GT4, by the way, as there is the Team Abba Racing car serving the penalty. GT4, it is Conor O'Brien leading. It's TF Sport 1-2, 95 ahead of 97. Remember, it's 97 that's ahead in the championship, joint championship leader, actually, is the 97 TF Sport Aston Martin, which runs second, 10.9 seconds behind the leader, uh, and lapping about the same sort of pace. Third place, though, whisper it because they had some terrible luck when they were running in a podium place last time at Alton but it is the Speedworks uh, Toyota of Sam Smelt who runs third in GT4 he's got a three and a half second cushion over Jordan Albert's uh, Academy Motorsport Mustang in fourth and the Toyota I'm sure there would be a big celebration amongst the Speedworks crew if they could bring it home on the podium this time absolutely right yes the number eight Mercedes you just saw serving that stop go I have a feeling that was for an infringement either in terms of a, a pit protocol or personnel because it's pit stop time was okay. So it wasn't to do with being under on the pit stop time as, as I understand it from TSL and we're still trying to get to the bottom of what it is that's being looked at at number 78 post race. However, right now, first to second is 5.9 seconds, first to third is 6.7 and that means that the gap here, second to third, the two Lamborghinis, is seven tenths of a second or a Nats Crompton. There's nothing in it really. Sandy Mitchell, experienced Lamborghini racer. Andrea Caldarelli, experienced Lamborghini racer. Welcome, Andrea, to British GT. Italian driving. He lives in London these days. And uh, you could almost argue this is a home circuit. First time he's raced here. Could he score a debut win when he's throwing everything at it? And with half an hour to go, don't rule it out. Yeah, exactly. It feels like we're getting to the end of this race, but we're actually only three quarters of the way through. As you said, just under 30 minutes left. Caldarelli is now less than a second behind Sandy Mitchell. He's less than seven seconds behind the race leader. He's quicker through the S's as well and gets a good run on the 78 car down to the Melbourne. Luke Mitchell will move over to defend. No, he won't. Leaves the door open on the inside. Now, is he letting him go or is he looking for the grippier side of the road? It might be the former, actually, because Caldarelli made that look quite easy. Mitchell does get the better exit with the wider line in. It won't matter actually for 78 whether they finish second or third in this race. They will still, as it stands, take the championship lead away from the team, uh, the Jensen Team Rocket RJN car, which now in the hands of James Baldwin has fallen down to sixth place overall. So third place will still be enough for 78 to take over the points lead going into race two later on this afternoon. And of course, if they finish third in this race, they spend less time in the pit lane in race two, and it's a shorter race, hard to come back from that pit stop penalty. It is indeed, that's right. So right now, it is game on between Super Trofeo champion of years past, Patrick Kuyula, and current Lamborghini factory driver, and in the case of FFF Racing Team in Europe, uh, team principal, player manager, Andrea Calderelli. Kuyula having to adapt this year to the uh, Mercedes, although he has got recent experience of other cars such as Porsches because he raced in Carrera Cup Italy last year but the Mercedes is new to him and he leads by 6.1 seconds 28 minutes on the clock this is going to be interesting and the way that he's going suggests that Calderelli will get there before the end as the cars now turn out of coppice uh, yes uh, Calderelli is on tires of roughly the same age as Kuyula as well isn't he they're yeah. pitted within a lap or so of each other so tires and tire wear should not be a factor there is Kuyula the leader through the chicane we wait, we wait, we wait, we wait, and there is Calderelli in second, about six or so seconds behind. Hammers the curbs there through the chicane, he's pushing on. But look at the first sector, how close they are. Yeah. Kuyula was a thousandth quicker than Calderelli. And quicker than him in sector two. Yeah, by a bit more, hundreds, but so evenly matched in the first sector that this is going to be a tough one. Traffic will be key to it all. 27 and a half minutes, tick, 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 down goes the clock. There is Calderelli then. He was saying to me last night, he was off to ask Phil Keane about data and to explain how to get through the chicane. He said, I've never raced here before. I love the circuit, it's great, but I cannot get the S's right at the end of the lap. Now, we have the second place car, Andrea Calderelli at the wheel. Michael Igo, perhaps looking forward to a maiden victory. Let's see, and let's hear his thoughts. He's with Kelvin Fletcher. Hey guys, I'm here with Michael Igo. Michael, like myself, you're a bronze driver, but in that stint there, you were absolutely terrific. I think your pace for a good segment of the race was up there uh, beyond the silver drivers, so uh, you, you must be happy with that stint. Yeah, really happy. It was uh, the car was great. It was good driving out there. It's in real technical conditions. Um, 
we just put all, all on different lines to obviously in the dry, but we found the pace we needed and we, we went up five places before the pit stop. So it was good. Now, obviously, your, your teammate here, Cardinelli, is on an absolute flyer. He's just taken, I think, second place on the lead. Yeah, he's up to second now. He's just passed Sandy Mitchell, so hopefully we'll head uh, first place now. We'll definitely try and bring it home the best we can. Now, you said before when I came to you, you said, oh, Kelvin, I'm a little bit nervous behind camera, but I've got to say, mate, you're just as good on camera as you are in the wedding car, so whatever you do, mate, keep it up. Okay, thank you very much. Talk thank you. you. Guys. Cheers, Kelvin. So... Lots of different co-drivers, Michael Iko, late starter in racing, he's what, 32 years of age now, the man from Nutsford, but he's learnt well from the likes of Adam Wilcox, Dennis Lind, uh, now Andrea Calgarelli, and uh, he's had a uh, successful time in things like the GT Cup, but he's not had a British GT win, nor has Andrea Calgarelli, he's never raced in British GT, he's never raced at Donington, this could be, as I say, the dream debut, but even if Calgarelli catches Kuyula, and he is catching him, no question, Patrick isn't just going to let him by. This is going to be a really fierce fight. 25 minutes on the clock. And we also need to keep an eye on what the road is doing. Because look, they're both going for the wetter part of the road coming past the pits. He's taking all of the time out of Kuyla in the last sector. The last two laps, they've matched each other in sectors one and two. But on both occasions, Calderelli's taking the best part of a second out of him. It's the Phil Keen line, clearly. Because yes. that, <laughs> that sector includes the S's that yesterday he said he couldn't get right. So Calderelli owes this win if it does become a win. <laughs> Purely to Phil Keane, clearly, in his amazing data through the chicane. The road is looking drier, absolutely. Now, you start to think we're at that tipping point. Lap times are still improving in some cases, but we're not getting purple laps anymore. We're getting the on-purple sector, I grant you, but are they going to be OK to survive, especially if you're pushing hard, in the case of Calderelli, on wet tyres right to the very end? Uh, Sandy Mitchell is still in third place dropping away a little now and being caught by Yelma Berman. So third and fourth, it's a big gap, but we're not done there either. Uh, yes, indeed, 15 seconds between the two of them and Berman and Keane, fourth and fifth, are pretty much matching each other at the moment. Jack Mitchell is, I think, about to take seventh place away from uh, Ollie Wilkinson, who was several seconds quicker than him on the previous lap. That is the two C's McLaren catching the optimum example. Uh, and they're only about four seconds behind James Baldwin. So Jack Mitchell uh, could get into sixth place overall here. There's a few significances to that. He would take some points away from the car that was leading the championship going into this race, could also get themselves onto the Silver Cup podium in this race. And there are separate points for the Silver Cup. They're all gunning for the overall championship, of course. Uh, but um, I'm sure they'll uh, give uh, a little bit of attention at the end of the race to where they came within their individual class. Andrea Calderelli, oh so close to getting on board of McLaren there. Gus Bowers was about to have some company, so close did they get. The lead gap is 3.8 seconds, and that means that on that lap, another half a second is taken out, and three tenths alone were in that last sector. So Andrea Calderelli is doing exactly the right thing. Now, is Patrick Kuyola looking after his tyres? Is he genuinely not able to up his pace? Is he biding his time? Is he thinking, OK, let's just see what the gap is and I'll push if I need to push? Or is he genuinely going to be on the back foot? Phil Key, absolute best in the last sector. <laughs> yes, well, yes, so uh, clearly the line that he taught, Andrea Calderelli, is working quite well for him as well. He's 4.9 seconds uh, behind Yalba Berman. Now he took about six tenths or so, seven tenths, in fact, down to him uh, on the previous lap in the fight for fourth place. And uh, Phil Keane and Adam Ballon, of course, gunning for the championship as well this year, and they should be in contention, uh, you would imagine, when we get to the end of the season. In GT4, 95 is leading the way. Conor O'Brien comes across the line to complete his 51st lap of racing, and I'll give you the gap in a few seconds too. Dan Vaughan in the Sister 97 car in second place. It was 90 five that got the team's first win of the year at Alton Park, but it was 97 that had the more consistent day with a third and a second place finish, and Dan Ford is 11 and a half back, so although he was quicker on the previous lap, the gap has gone out, I believe, or more or less stabilised uh, from the start of the stint. Sam Smelt is 14 seconds further back in the Toyota, and I think he's keeping Jordan Albert at bay in the Mustang as well. This, the fight I was talking about before, Optimum being caught by two Cs, uh, Ollie Wilkinson coming under pressure from Jack Mitchell, and this is the fight uh, for seventh place overall. Mitchell goes to the outside, but the uh, Mia Blue, no, the Ewan Hankey driven um, 20. Uh, one McLaren in GT4 is in the way that doesn't stop him getting the switch back on the inside though and Jack Mitchell they're going to go almost either side of the GT4 McLaren but the two GT3 guys go to the inside line Wilkinson on the inside Mitchell's late on the brakes they're going to go wheel to wheel into the corner and Mitchell thought about tuffing it out around the outside I suspect that wouldn't have ended well no indeed now let's catch up on other matters from the opening stint Marathon Man having driven 
for so, so long in the leading car. Rob Collard, and Rob is with Kelvin. So, Rob, still, I think, only your third race in the British GT. Obviously, new this year, vastly experienced driver. Great first stint in the wet. And then it looked like the guys in the commentary box were saying, when's he going to pit? And, and, and it was quite clear to see that you're going to take the gamble and stay out there, anticipating the track to continue driving, and then up for the slick, so that would obviously give you a huge advantage. Yeah. Sadly, it didn't work out that way. And you said before you were looking for a lap time, about 38 in order to, yeah. to, to make that change. We were looking at, the, um, looking at the lap time all the time, and just they asked me what the conditions were to get, whether to get some slicks ready. Um, and I said it's like 50-50, really, because I think you, you could have run with slicks at that point, but it seemed like the track got a bit damper again, a bit more moisture came in the air. And to be safe, they left me out for as long as possible, and I was like just trying to manage the tyre, doing like mid-42s, I think it was at that time. Um, and now that Sandy's gone out, and he's, he's really only doing the same lap time, maybe 41s. So I think the track's got a little bit slower again, so obviously there is some moisture. It. Sometimes it's worth a gamble, and yeah. uh, unfortunately it didn't pay off. But you're still there or thereabouts, so uh, still all, all in all, uh, you know, a great stint and a great race so far. Yeah, that's my first like one out of full one hour stint. So it was quite hard to keep your concentration towards the end when you're just out on your own. Um, but yeah, I'm really enjoying my sort of first debut and campaign in British GTs. I wish I'd done it years ago. Thanks, Kelvin. Good to hear from Rob Collard. Great character and. Uh, talked about how that was his first long, long stint. Well, bearing in mind, when he started racing, he was in oval racing following his dad, where races are done in about six or seven minutes. So uh, an hour plus is a very different discipline altogether. Patrick Kuyula leads round three of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship here from Donington Park. David Anderson and Andy McHugh are watching a really tense situation because Kuyula's Mercedes is being caught by Andrea Caldarelli there in second place. Caldarelli, new to Donington Park, new to the WI, uh, WPI team, not new to the car, the gap 3.3 seconds with just under 20 minutes to go, the road we feel is drying, lap times are starting to come down again, suggesting that to be the case, and they're all on wet tyres, so we're still expecting an element, if it carries on drying out like this, of tyre preservation towards the end, and you will see the cars moving to the wetter part of the road to try to preserve the life in the Pirelli rubber. But Andy, that gap's coming down again. It is. It's stabilised on the last lap, but on this particular lap, yeah, it's down by another tenth or so, and we know that Caldarelli is particularly good in the final sector, the part of the circuit they're on right now. That, that mid-engine Lamborghini, I think it just accelerates better out of the tight hairpins, maybe. It's by far the slowest part of the track, and completely in contrast to the rest of the circuit, which is fast and flowing, suits the front-engine Mercedes, but it's set to three he is quicker over the lap he is quicker to the tune of three tenths it's not coming down by as much as it was earlier on maybe Caldarelli is also entering into a bit of tyre preservation yeah. now and that poses another question which of these cars is going to look after the tyres better we've made the point engines in different places they're designed completely differently maybe one car and I would suggest maybe the Lamborghini is going to be a bit lighter on its tyres and that could come into play we still have 18 and a half minutes for this to play out Indeed so. So the pendulum hasn't really decided which way it's going to swing, has it? It's sort of rocking in the middle, really, yet to determine which way to go. In GT4, uh, we have the 95 Aston Conor O'Brien then in the lead there, having taken over from Patrick Kibble. Second is 97 Dan Vaughan, having taken over from uh, Jamie Caroline, as you see Calderelli up through the traffic, getting ahead of Sam Smelt. Third in GT4 now is number 61, so Matt Cowley has given way to Jordan Albert, ex-single-seater racer, ex-McLaren GT4 racer, very much involved in the ISO uh, driver simulator uh, company these days is Jordan. And in fact, he has just, on that last lap, lost a spot to Sam Smelt at the time it's been update. So Sam Smelt's Toyota now goes up into third place at the expense of Jordan Albert with Gus Boas in the uh, HHC 57, McLaren ahead of teammate Jordan Collard in 58. There is 57, so that is Gus Bowers, remember we saw him almost being roughed up by the GT3 cars a little earlier on in the race. So you've got them, Aston Martins 1-2, Toyota still 3, and Sam Smell lapping quicker last time by 8 tenths than Dan Ford. Uh, yeah, Dan Ford in the 97, which should be the car that uh, takes full ownership of the GT4 points lead after this race. They came in tied uh, with the 57 HHC car, but that car's down in uh, what fifth the GT4. Uh, and this car, of course, running in second. It is being caught, uh, but barring any major disasters, I'm not sure they're going to get caught. The Aston Martins, Aston Martin always go well here, don't they? Oh, no, that is the optimum car of Ollie Wilkinson off. I was 
about to make the point. He was actually keeping up with Jack Mitchell quite well, having been overtaken. Maybe he was pushing too hard to do so. Thankfully, though, not just for him, but for the rest of the field who don't want a safety car, he got out of the gravel trap and continued, and he might not have lost... A, uh, he might have lost one place, but not much more. That's wet gravel for you, compacting. Phil Keane has just done the best lap of the race at 39 now, 139.863. Yelma Berman has done an absolute best in the first sector as well, so that suggests that it's drying a little bit more now as the lap times are starting to look a bit more racy. Remember, this car was off the road earlier on and had a longer pit stop. Uh, yeah, good fight back, actually. They've overcooked the, the, the misfortune at Donington this time. Uh, so Phil Keane, oh, this is uh, Wilkinson going off. Uh, easy to lose the rear there, isn't it? You, as you turn into the apex at Coppice, there's a little crest. The road flattens out suddenly. In a front-wheel drive car, you tend to understeer towards the gravel truck, but in a rear-wheel drive GT car, especially on possibly slightly jelly-like tyres, uh, it's very easy to swap ends there and, and go backwards into the gravel trap. Uh, Phil Keane's fastest lap then, a 139.8. So Rob Collard record the 38 was the point at which you could change the slicks. Now, at this late stage, no one will try that, I don't think. Uh, but uh, it's just as well, maybe, that they didn't keep the car out there much longer. They'd have had to wait right till the end to be able to put those slick tyres on. Yeah, we'd have lost too much time to make up, as you say, in the remaining 15 minutes. Wait, not even that, because we're not yet at that point. The lead gap is 1.6 seconds, though, now Cuyana to Caldarelli. So, I mean, not only is it a great battle, not only is it a fascinating race, what underlines the strength of the championship as well, that here are two of Europe's top GT drivers plying their trade for the weekend in the British GT Championship. Because I'm an old so-and-so, I was here for the very first one in 1993. About eight cars, they were all Porsches. It was very much a glorified club race. And here you've got what is the top national GT Championship there is. And Kuyla and Calderelli are set to duke it out with quarter of an hour to go. There is. 1.6 seconds of a margin at the start of the lap. It went up by uh, 500 in the second sector. It's right in the mid in the first sector. It might come down a bit in the second, but again, there's the traffic to factor into all of this as well. And Andrea Calderelli on his Donington debut, pushing, 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 closing up on Kuyla. Yelma Berman is doing absolute best in sectors. A tenth taken back by Calderelli as they're way up over the sausage curve, bounces Patrick Kuyla. Now he knows he's in a motor race. If he's thinking about trying to look after the rubber, OK, that's still a good idea, but he's just going to have to work the tiles that little bit harder because Calderelli is a coming. Uh, yep, Calderelli in the Lamborghini, a Pro-Am car, so it's a bit lighter, actually. They add some ballast into the Silver Cup cars in uh, both GT3 and GT4. And uh, so the GT3 Mercedes maybe has worked its tyres harder because of that. Look at the way that Calderelli is closing. 14 minutes remaining then. How wide can Patrick Cuyola make that Mercedes AMG GT3? Because he has got the uh, red Lamborghini now right on his tail as they head towards Redgate Corner. Different lines being taken. Cuyola making absolutely sure that he didn't drive defensively there. He knew Calderelli wasn't quite close enough. But that 69 Mercedes could be on borrowed time. Calderelli the fastest lap of the race. 139.7. That's why the purple graphic is there to say it's the fastest lap then. Calderelli, the quickest man on the road. That car started, don't forget, ninth after qualifying, which effectively was seventh in the queue because we had one in the pits and one non-starting. But even so, it's had to work its way up through the field as traffic. But Calderelli lets the back market take his line, eases to the inside. So that's where the experience comes of reading the traffic. Don't forget, these are two of Europe's top GT drivers, Calderelli especially after winning the GT World Challenge Europe Sprint and Endurance titles, and therefore the overall, the combined championship last year. Spent a lot of time in Japan racing single-seaters and then GT cars has come back into Europe and is very much a key part of the Lamborghini success. And you can see why, can't you? The gap six tenths at the start of this lap. Is he going to make a move down at the Melbourne Heavy? He can afford to bide his time. He doesn't have to do it straight away. He can sit there for a lap, apply the pressure to Patrick Cuyana to assess where the Mercedes is strong, where the Lamborghini is strong. Also, see where the traffic is. It's looking when, not if, he strikes for the race lead. Up the hill, in towards Goddard's, and this will complete 61 laps. Calderelli look closing under braking. Breaks so late, actually, he goes deep into the corner. Now he comes off Goddard's pulls the trigger, fires over the line, the gap is going to be, what, three tenths? Let's see, yes, 0.336 as they go across the line. You've got the Valve GT4 McLaren there, they're going to have to negotiate. So the uh, number 69, Patrick Kuyula, Mercedes, tiptoes out of Redgate. 
where is the gap? Calderelli crawling all over the back of him as they go down through the crater curves, absolutely nose to tail. Cuyola gets past the slower car, and for the moment, boxes in Calderelli. So he's got a couple of length breathing space, if not more, but Calderelli knows he can get that time back. Calderelli backed out of that then. He was a lot closer to Cuyola going through Hollywood, and then seeing the situation in front of him, he thought, I don't need to get involved in that. They, these two cars are getting very close together. There could be a collision. The worst thing that could happen for Calderelli is that he gets wiped out in an accident that wasn't his fault and that actually had nothing to do with him. So he backed off knowing, as you said quite rightly, that he's probably got the pace to just cruise back onto the tail of the Mercedes anyway. But look at the way the gap has opened out through backing off, sitting behind the Ewan Hankey driven GT4 McLaren through the Craner curves. The gap is now closer to a second, whereas it was three tenths at the start of the lap. Nervous faces at Ram Racing and there'll be nervous faces for the WPI Motorsport squad as well. But Calderelli then is looking oh so strong here as the car heads down towards the Melbourne hairpin. So in the first sector, the gap had gone up by three tenths. It's gone up by half a second in the second sector, but I still think Calderelli has got this made, really. He's brought most of that gap down, as you see, coming out of the old hairpin. We're almost into the last 10 minutes as they break again for Goddard. Calderelli takes a tighter line this time. Pulls back another length as they go out of the left-hander, ready now to accelerate up over the timing line. It's going to be, what, from three tenths, two tenths, yeah, and 0 0.291 the margin. Calderelli looks to the inside line down towards Redgate. Cuyola defends. They're going to get five more laps out of this, I would predict, as they come now onto the top of the crater curves. If Patrick Cuyola has never driven a wide car before, this is the time to do it. That thing has got a growing width. Andrea Calderelli will be eyeing up where the Mercedes is strong, where he's got the advantage, where the extra grip is as well, where there's a bit more scope in terms of more dry room along, along the racetrack's width as there. They go through Schwartz curve. We are on lap 63, two tenths of a second between the top two, 10 minutes of two hours of racing to go, and the top two absolutely together as Calderelli now starts to plan the move, which will begin coming out of Coppice. The last time we covered a British GT race together, David, was Silverstone last year, and we had a similar situation That's involving right, yes. a Ram Racing Mercedes right. trying desperately to get a race win in the dying moments. That day they were racing against uh, Johnny Adam in the uh, TS4 Aston Martin. They are defending the lead here from Calderelli, and the problem I think Cuyola will have is that we know where the Lamborghini is quicker. It's the final sector, and that's where you do the overtaking. The big stop into Melbourne, the big stop into Goddard, traction off the tight corners. Here we go into the Melbourne hairpin. But Cuyola is wise to it and defends the inside line. But the Mercedes should be good out of the slow corners because it's got all that torque. The Lamborghini is good on aero, and here it is. Look, it's quick out of the corner. Calderelli will get his nose in front on the outside line. Cuyola defends the inside line, but even if he gets the lead here, he's going to run out a little bit wide. Calderelli gets the switch back. He's going to fire the gun alongside him, but that's the outside line for Redgate. Now here, nice, long, fast pit straight. Can that very svelte Lamborghini get its nose in front to take the race lead going into Redgate? We start lap 64. Calderelli was ahead by 14,000, so he has led the race, but he's on the outside line. He's going to keep on coming, and he's done. Fantastic move, right round the outside goes Andrea Calderelli to lead British GT at Donington Park. He deserves that, he worked oh so hard for it, but Cuyola has not given up yet. Sam de Haan comes out to be interviewed, Cuyola's car looked for the inside line, but Calderelli has done it, and now he should be able to stay there. What a stint. If Cuyola, if Cuyola's going to come back at him, it has to be before the final sector, doesn't it? That's why he was so desperate to get to the inside. Look how much better he is on the brakes into McLean's, sails into the corner, but on the tight line on the entry, he's slower off the corner. Yes, the Mercedes has low-end grunt and torque off the tight corners, but it's just the traction that Lamborghini has. So much more grip, it gets the power down better, and that is ultimately how he made that stick. It took him the best part of a third of a lap to do it, but he did eventually find himself on the grippier line into Redgate, and now he is starting to get away. So, disappointment for Sam de Haan. He is, however, chipper enough to talk to Kelvin. Sam... Lamborghini was catching, 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 and unfortunately for you guys, it's just had you on that lap there. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, the, the, the Pro-Am Lambo runs a little bit lighter than ours, so a bit better on the tyre here. I think we had a really good race anyway, I had a really good stint, a really clean stint behind the Lambo and the McLaren. Got lucky, I think Michael made a mistake, so, you know, it's not too bad, we're still leading the silver class, it's the best we can hope for at the moment, I think. I thought it was a mega stint that you had first, I think, you know, you, you were up from third there and uh, attacking the whole stint. Obviously, when uh, when you always pass over to the teammate, there's always that 
that chance there for opportunities to arise. Obviously, I look like a clean pit stop that you guys had, yeah. so yeah. that was good. And then uh, just sadly, there, as I mentioned, it's just the last couple of laps there. You just you seem to be pit, but still in the game. I think five or six minutes left, and still yeah. all to play for. I mean, it was a bit of an odd start because the the two. <laughs> The two McLarens behind me were in the pits for some reason, I'm not sure why. So there's a bit of a gap, and I think the, fr the front three of us checked out a little bit. So they're just kind of biding my time. The Merck's really, really good on the tyres here, like end of the stint, last 10 minutes. So I tried to take advantage of that. I think if there was 10 more minutes, we might have just done the Lambo for, for the lead, but we got them in the pit stop because of the success penalty. So all around is a clean stint. I couldn't ask for any more than that. Well, keep your fingers crossed. It's still time yet. Cheers, thank you. As Sam DeHaan rightly says, they are still leading the silver element of GT3. Calderelli and I go, of course, a pro-am, so there's a class within a class to be won here. Third is Sandy Mitchell, who is 16 seconds back. That car's dropped away quite noticeably, actually. Elba Berman is fourth there in the battered Mercedes. Phil Keane fifth, only 1.2 seconds behind him. And all of a sudden, Sam Neary has done the fastest lap of the race, a 139.133. File that under the what heading because that came out of nowhere, didn't it? Sam is a quick drive, you know, relatively inexperienced, but a lot of his racing has been done at the wheel of that Mercedes that he shares with his father, Richard. They raced in a couple of championships last year in that car and would races. Uh, it is, meanwhile, another Mercedes that is attacking here for a podium, but that body, which they've hastily taped down in the stop, is starting to work loose again. We're in a similar situation, though, aren't we? We're only probably about three laps from the end, so they might just hang on. They are catching Sandy Mitchell in the 78 Lamborghini, and look who is arriving on their tail, Sandy's team. Teammate Phil Keane, who up until Sam Neary's astonishing lap last time around, uh, was routinely the quickest driver on the track. So just because the race lead may have been settled in the favour of WPI Motorsport does not mean that the podium places are settled just yet. Absolutely, because Yelma Berman, very, very fast driver, very experienced at Donington, Formula Renault, Formula 3, GT cars. He is right there, breathing down the neck of Sandy Mitchell, as you say, down through the crane as they go, out of Hollywood, into the crane curves itself and then to the old hairpin. Still we're getting track limits warnings as people are getting a little bit more carried away, but they're not affecting things in terms of penalties. But I still reckon, looking at the way these go, that Berman, as long as that bonnet doesn't fly off, he's going to get third before the end. But right now, if I were the team, I'd be getting a bit nervous about that. I do fear, certainly when he's on a fast section, that there's more and more air getting underneath. He goes around the outside of Sandy Mitchell coming off McLean's. That is a very brave move, and he's done it, has he? He's got his nose in front up to cop it. Excellent move. Brilliant stuff by Yelma Berman. Found the grip on the outside, and now around the outside of Coppice goes Phil Keane. But is that bodywork going to stay there for another four minutes? It's looser now, I think, than it was in the first part of the race, isn't it? So uh, yeah. the tape worked for a while, but of course... Uh, it is still very much going to be an issue for them, I think, and, and what is maybe a more pressing issue is Phil Keane, because, yeah, you're right, he took full advantage of that. It was a, a double hit, really, for Sandy Mitchell. Not only did he get overtaken by Berman, but he was stuck on the inside slippery line at Coppice, and that allowed Keane through. A bit puzzled as to why Sandy Mitchell's losing so much pace, because he's a quick driver, and he knows the car, so makes one slightly worried about the... the overall state of that he's falling away and he's going to lose another place isn't he to jack mitchell considering how many woes that car has had it's amazing that number 10 is still in contention at all but it might even get another position before the end we're just over three and a half minutes away from the race ending and suddenly the lead gap has shot up to three and a half seconds so it's calderelli cuyla and berman that is the order berman and Keane, remember as pro-am entrance their cars are lighter so that might be having something yeah, to do with this and of course they ought to be quicker than the silver graded Sandy Mitchell although he's done a brilliant job as did uh, his teammate Rob Collard in the first part of the race so that's possibly what it is ah, now this isn't ideal for Andrea Calderelli that is Ollie Wilkinson in the almost one lap down off from Motorsport McLaren who is in fairness I think trying to get out of the way but it's just so slippery that it's hard to be precise about it isn't it and, and at a part of the circuit like that you are going to get close together all it takes is a slip from one of these back markers and Calderelli could be in trouble but uh, yeah on left to his own devices he is quick enough I think to bring this home with now less than three minutes to go absolutely right you see number nine Dean McDonald still 21st 22 laps down I doubt the car will be classified it might be uh, but uh, either way the car is proving it's healthy ready to go in the second race Yelma Berman is still hunting down Kuyla he's done the absolute best in the middle sector he's not going to get there in time with only two minutes on the clock and a flying lap is just around about the minute 40 mark if you average it for the leading cars there in third place is Berman still being chased by Keane fifth is Mitchell sixth you can see Jack Mitchell behind in the two-seat motorsport McLaren 
cars looking particularly grimy at the end of a race like this. As there, with the bodywork a flapping still, is Yelma Berman. So what have we got? Two minutes on the clock, two more laps they're going to squeeze out of this. Calderelli leading Cuyula by 3.8 seconds. It would be a shame not to have a Barwell Lamborghini on the podium because they both of their cars have, have been quick. Phil Keen fastest lap though, 138.598. There's every chance we might still get a Barwell Lamborghini on the podium, but only two tenths quicker than Berman. They're the two quickest drivers on the track right now, along with still Sam Neary, who again consistently is in the low one minute 39, not quite on their pace. But when you consider the extra years, arguably decades of experience that people like Yama Berg and Phil Keane have over Sam Neary, that is some seriously impressive pace. Thinking ahead to race two later on, without a success penalty, that car could be a factor. Could indeed, absolutely right. So, it is the WPI Motorsport car, the uh, team run by Alan Roberts that leads the way, and Rand Calderelli set for a maiden, indeed, debut win in British GT. Michael Igo, his co-driver, will have a maiden victory at this level, but he's won in GT Cup, the sort of club-level GT series. A minute change on the clock, Phil Keane, fastest man on the circuit, still hunting down Yelma Berman, and where in all of this is the race leader... Andrea Calderelli is about to head up towards the timing line. A word about James Baldwin. Remember, that car led the bulk of the first one, three quarters of an hour. A somewhat distant eighth is the heavy McLaren. So the, the, the extra weight has told as the road has dried out. James Baldwin's inexperience, I think, here is also a factor. I don't mean that rudely, but you put him up against the likes of Calderelli with his glittering CV in real-world racing. And, of course, James Baldwin can't really hope, I don't think, to be... Uh, competing at the same lap time. So we go through now with less than a lap time left in the race. Andrea Calderelli leading Cuyula by five and a half seconds. In fairness to Paul, well, he's not made a mistake, though, and that really is a big part of learning your craft in this discipline of racing. You know, he's had very tricky conditions out there. He, yes, took over the car in a potential race-winning position, but uh, he's kept it out of the gravel, while so many other far more experienced drivers have not been able to do that. So I still give him some credit. They're running fourth in the Silver Cup as well, ahead of uh, Optimum and a couple of others that have problems, of course, Juicy Boat, Juicy Motorsport, for example, also spotted uh, a half a lap ago or so that Jordan Albert has caught Sam Smelt very rapidly, the third in GT4. They, of course, have two more laps to go, and the gap is only three seconds. Surely Speedworks not going to get robbed of another podium for the third race in a row. Let's keep an eye to it. It's going to be the flag this time. There, Where is the... GT4 battle on the road relative to this car. Are they going to be directly behind it and get the flag, or is it going to be another lap which will give extra chance to uh, Jordan Albert? We've got Jack Mitchell briefly ahead of Sam Neary. Sam Neary back ahead of him for sixth place then, but this is the race leading car down towards the Melbourne hairpin. Andrea Calderelli has just done the absolute best in the middle sector as the road dries towards the end. Suddenly we're going green and purple all over the timing screen here as up towards the Checkered flag comes Andrea Calderelli. So Michael Igo started and did a great job. Alan Roberts' team is going to have a first win within the British GT Championship. Michael Igo and Andrea Calderelli, victorious at Donington. Round three of the Intelligent Money British GT Championship is won by Andrea Calderelli and Michael Igo. Second, Patrick Pugula and Sam Dehan. They are the winning Silver Cup contingent as well. Third is going to be a very close run thing, but Yelma Berman and Ian Loggy will just survive ahead of the Phil Keane, Adam Ballon, Lamborghini. If Adam hadn't been off the road at the Melbourne Hairpin, you could argue that would have been that place. But as it was, Phil Keane is fourth and sets the fastest lap of the race. Fifth will go to Jack Mitchell, no, to, to Sandy Mitchell, rather, and Rob Collard. Sixth was trading all the way through. In the meantime, we await the GT4 cars home. And they are in the queue, still to come pouring out of the left-hander of Goddard's. And uh, this is the car that will win in GT4, number 95 then. So Connor O'Brien and uh, Patrick Kibble, really good, solid job done by both of them. Excellent driving by both, excellent teamwork. Now, it's all got battles to be resolved here, look, because Sam Neary is going to be sick. He'll fend off Jack Mitchell for seventh. With all the time lost in the early dramas of Jordan Witt, makes you wonder what that car could have done as well. But it is Sam and Richard Neary for sixth, seventh for Jack Mitchell and Jordan Witt. A win in GT4 for Connor O'Brien and Patrick Kibble. Second will go to this car of Dan Bourne and... Uh, Jamie Caroline and then the question is who's going to be third because it is the Toyota that comes out of Goddard's the Speedworks run Toyota the GR Supra GT4 GR for Gazoo Racing takes third in class Sam Smelt and uh, James Kell take third then a return to the podium for Speedworks in GT4 the team that ran 
the patron, Christian Dick, to the GT4 title a long time ago in Ginetta days with Jamie Stanley. But uh, these days, as a manufacturer supported team, effectively with the link with Toyota and the Supra third in class. But a great result for TF as well. Tom Ferrier's team, a 1 2 for the Aston Martins. But what a result for Andrea Calvarelli and for Michael Igo. Great partnership. I mean, Andrea parachuted in. I said to him yesterday, where's Dennis Lynn? Don't know. I've just got this phone call. Do you want to race at Donington? So here I am, uh, the London-based Italian. Never raced here before. Trying conditions thrown at him. Uh, of course, he's racing against a lot of people he's never come across before, so he doesn't know how they're going to respond when you come up to lap them or race against them. A great job. Andrea Calderelli and Michael Igo win the first of two races here at Donington in the Intelligent Money British GT Championship from Patrick Kuyula and Sam Dehaan. Ian Loggy third with Yelma Berman ahead of Phil Keane and Adam Ballon. Having led the bulk of the race, it felt like, or certainly the middle third, uh, Sam, uh, Sandy Mitchell and Rob Collard take fifth ahead of Sam Neary and Richard Neary's Mercedes six. Seventh for Jordan Witt and uh, Jack Mitchell from Michael O'Brien and James Baldwin. Then Ollie Wilkinson and Lewis Proctor with 10th, Duncan Cameron and Matt Griffin. Scott Morvan and Nick Jones next. And in the 13th place, the first of the two TF Sport, Aston Martin that wins in GT4. Conor O'Brien and Patrick Kibble ahead of Dan Vaughan and Jamie Caroline. Third in GT4 for the Toyota uh, of uh, the Speedworks Motorsport squad, that being Sam Smelt and James Kell coming home in 15th place overall. Now we have, of course, another race for the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. That is due to start, all being well, at half past four. So the teams have a little bit of time to fettle cars. Thankfully, nobody with damage, nobody with mechanical dramas that we know of. And uh, they're very happy, Andrea Calderelli. Job done. You know, he's a pro driver. It doesn't matter who his co-driver is, who the team is. Lamborghini say, go and drive this car, drive it as fast as you can, and also help your uh, less experienced co-driver develop. Well, he's ticked all those boxes, hasn't he? There you have the uh, drivers, Yama Berman and Phil Keane, having a conversation about their fight for third place. Phil Keane with the fastest lap. Lauren Granville, the championship manager, comes to make sure the drivers know the podium protocol. There will be a podium, although it's obviously a socially distanced podium, so there'll be a relative lack of hugging and uh, lack of interviews, but they will be there to celebrate to come what may. And Andrea Calderelli, I think he'd be pretty pleased with the Donington debut like that. Uh, and so will WPR Motorsport, who were well down in the points we into this race, but that win puts them, I reckon, about fourth in points. By my maths, Barwell's 72 and Ram Racing's 69 uh, are now joint championship leaders in GT3 on 43 points, with Barwell's 78 third. Remember I said earlier on, as long as they were on the podium, they'd come away with the points lead. Well, they didn't finish on the podium, so they've dropped down to third. Only three points off, though, and as we keep saying, they will not have a success penalty in the shorter one-hour race later on. In GT4, uh, TF Sport will have uh, big smiles on their faces, not only because they finished 1-2 in that race, but they're now on to in the championship, 95 just ahead of 97. But it, it does set us up brilliantly for that second race later on, doesn't it? A shorter race, completely different dynamic, therefore. There's every chance the conditions will be different, too. And those success penalties arguably have a bigger impact in the shorter races because you just don't give the second driver enough time to properly overcome it. 97, uh, Aston Martin, that led the first bit in GT4, finished 11 seconds adrift, but it had 15 seconds in the pit stop. Yeah, so it yeah. shows you how it works, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. And some people, uh, I, I see some comments online from uh, people watching from home, and they, they sometimes question why we have these success penalties. Well, it's not fair if they're doing well, they're leading the race, why should they have to spend longer in the pit lane? Well, because it keeps things close, it keeps things, things interesting, and it works, doesn't it? Because yeah. as you said, uh, you know, had it not been for the penalty, 97 would probably have won, but now it switches again for race two. Over the balance of the season, generally speaking, it does tend to even itself out. I mean, it doesn't always follow either that of course it's going to handicap you because it might be that somebody has a spin ahead or the safety car brings you into contention anyway uh, it's a regulation that works well let's catch up then with our victorious drivers kelvin fletcher is busy in park fair mate michael your first race win what a way to do it yeah in style to be fair uh, we had a great race we came up five places in my position and then over to andrea and what a job just brought it all the way Andrea, the Lamborghini looked absolutely terrific, especially in the third sector. That's where you looked really, really strong and was gaining on the Mercedes. Uh, was it was for you? Was it was it expected? Did you know that it was just going to come to you that position and it was just about biding your time and being patient? 
Well, I mean, we know that uh, uh, the Huracan is always quick in the in the wet. We have a, a very good confidence with the car. I didn't know after the pit stop, honestly, where I, I was more or less in thermal position. Uh, then when I saw the Barwell car uh, and the Mercedes in front, I said, OK, we have to do it. And uh, Michael did an amazing job with the, the first stint, so we had to do for the team. The guys were uh, amazing of the WPI and uh, Really, thanks to them and uh, to the Lamborghini Scuola Corsa for the fantastic car. And unfortunately, we've only got quite a quick turnaround now until the second race, so can't celebrate just yet. Uh, we just obviously get ready for the next race. What are your plans for the next race? Same, bit, bit, bit more of the same? Well, it depends on, on the weather condition, but, uh, you know, target is always to win. So. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Great job done by Andrea Calderelli and Michael Igo. Yeah. So, uh, we'll try and catch a, a, a word with our GT4 winners as well because heading towards that uh, interview area Conor O'Brien and Patrick Kibble so uh, Donington looking still not great but uh, drier and brighter than it was when the race started and good to see lots of people here as well because of course at the moment there's a peculiarity about what motor racing you can go and watch and so club and national racing rather than elite sports are doing better and uh, therefore British GT as it did at Alton Park enjoying a good number of people enjoying not only great racing and seeing fabulous cars but also enjoying a great circuit. Donington has always been uh, a fine venue and I suspect that agreement on that will come from Conor O'Brien and Patrick Kibble, our GT4 winners with Kelvin. Patrick, GT4 winners today. It looked like a pretty... Uh... Uh, a, a pretty a pretty good stint for you there was no, no real no incidents or anything like that your pace looked good in that first stint how did you feel yeah well starting fifth on the grid um honestly it was just like a matter of just keeping it clean uh, and lasting the whole hour on, on the on the track and uh, obviously making up the places i came into the pits in second but uh yeah literally i was having to close the gap to jamie because he brought out a massive gap for like the first half of the stint due to me being behind the others but uh yeah i managed to close that down and then coming into the pits, obviously we had, we didn't have the uh, the success penalty in the pits like the other car did, so that made, we managed to capitalise on that. And uh, yeah, we came out ahead in the on the on track after for Connor's stint, and and yeah, he did a great job to uh, keep the gap the same as, as it was. So happy for it, yeah. Because obviously the, the the conditions today were changing quite a lot. For a moment, there it looked like it was maybe going to go dry and it was potentially for slicks, but obviously you stayed on the wets. And it was just about ma managing those tyres towards the end. I guess uh, the car was changing throughout the balance of the car? Yeah, the balance was changing every lap. And it was just trying to find like the drying line where it wasn't too greasy. Just staying out of trouble, really. But Patrick done a mega stint, so made my life easy. Which is always nice. Well, well done, guys. Congratulations. Cheers. Thank you. And a great job done by uh, TF Sport then with a 1-2 in GT4. TF Sport won here in GT3 last June when we made our first visit of the year to uh, Donington Park. Those Aston Martins do go well at this particular circuit, be they GT3 or GT4 examples and uh, TF Sport uh, starting now to stretch away in the uh, GT4 championship as well. Uh, and we have to give a word, I think, though, with Speedworks. We mentioned it tentatively during the race for fear of uh, putting the, the mockers on them, but they have got that Toyota home in third position and for Sam Smelt and James Kell, a big result as well, really. You know, James Kell really until this year had not raced at this kind of level. He did Ginetta GT4 Super Cup last year, but that is something slightly different. And, and the same for Sam Smelt. Yes, he's raced in BTCC, but it's fair to say he didn't enjoy the success he would have liked. So that's a big career win for not only the team, not only for the car, but also for the drivers as well. Yes, that's right. As there we have the drivers then making their way up onto the podium and they'll be one at a time rather than on the usual 3-2-1 steps. So there you have the uh, third-placed crew in GT3, Ian Loggy and Yelma Berman. So they cop a success uh, pit stop penalty with the extra time going into race two. Then we will have the second-placed drivers. That's almost a trudge onto the podium for Sam Dehar. So close, but not quite in the end. He and Patrick Kuehler, who gave it a great shot, take second. Patrick, looking thoroughly dejected by that, can barely lift the trophy, but he gave it his all. And then it'll be a rather different attitude, I would have thought, from the race winners, Michael Igo and Andrea Calderelli, who will leap towards the podium. There is Michael Igo and Andrea Calderelli in his regulation green Lamborghini boots. Very happy indeed. He's a factory driver and uh, yet another different co-driver for Michael Igo. And it's his first British GT win. And uh, Andrea Calderelli, who dropped into Donington before, taking a great race win.
Yeah, nice for them to get a win here at Donington as well, because the last time they raced here, of course, they were involved in that championship showdown, and uh, they, they left, unfortunately, with a penalty hanging over them. So nice for them to uh, to get the race victory, and, and, and what a well-deserved one it was. Now, in Pro-Am, Phil Keane and Adam Ballon take third place. The uh, Barwell Lamborghini drivers. Second of the Pro-Ams uh, was Yelma Berman and Ian Loggy. And there they are. We've seen them once as an overall third. They're a class second. And, of course, the winning drivers outright are class winners. So the Pro-Am victors will be Andrea Caldarelli and uh, Michael Igo back for the top step of the podium. Notional top step, the podium, because it is dedicated to a crew at a time under these uh, current regulations. So they're the drivers. Michael Igo and Andrea Caldarelli. So, complimenti Andrea, makes his way across the podium. And there is the winning car. A little shamrock, but a four-leaf clover on the side of it. And uh, there, our third, crew in GT4, the taller Sam Smelt, and the stockier James Kell, taking the uh, trophy for third place. The teams in Park Fairmate waiting for the technical team to finish, and then they get the cars back, because they have not got much time to clean them, prep them, fuel them, put new tyres on do whatever they need to do for race two is there onto the podium go uh, our second place crew Jamie Caroline and Dan Vaughan taking second within GT4 and the class winners Conor O'Brien and Patrick Kibble doing Tom Ferrier's team proud of course TF busy at Spa in the World Endurance Championship busy at Donington in British GT but there Conor O'Brien and Patrick Kibble score honours in GT4 an excellent result for the team as much as for them with a, a one two finish patrick kibble former janessa junior racer conroe brown coming out of janessa's senior series for the same car the gt5 challenge then uh, also staying with gt4 they're the pro-am gt4 winners which are you and hanky and uh, mia fluid so uh, another victory for mia in that Balf run McLaren. Uh, yes, and a successful season they're having as well. Still up there in the uh, top four in the outright GT4 championship, and with a relative lack of pro am entries. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, in uh, in uh, GT4, uh, then uh, I think they very much are focusing on outright title honours, and uh, no reason at all based upon the pace they've had thus far this season uh, as to why they they can't uh, can't fight for that by the end of the year. Absolutely. Well, let's look back at what was a very eventful two hours at Donington Park. We had a safety car start because of the conditions. The race led for the bulk of what the first 40 minutes or so, give or take, by Michael O'Brien. Others, like Ian Loggy, were trying to make progress. Uh, other drivers lower down, like Lewis Proctor, finding their way up the field. Michael Igo was on his toes as well, gaining places, all of which will be crucial late in the race. He was on the back of the McLaren as they went through Schwantz Curve, coping with the spray early on, and in GT4, so quick was early leader Jamie Caroline. He was giving a hard time to Stuart Proctor's GT3. McLaren almost shoveling it out of the way, coming out of Schwantz Curve. I go on his toes, coming through the S's, made a move down towards the Melbourne hairpin. Off the road went Jordan Wick. It wasn't his only drama of a fairly checkered first stint, although when he was in the right direction, he was going pretty quickly. We had some good GT4 battles, helped in part by people running off the road. Patrick Kibble, for example, slithering out wide and giving a place back to Patrick Matisse. Jordan Witts had another look at a different part of Donington, dropped himself a bit more time as another people, another uh, person rather with a big slide. Richard Neary just about managed to avoid contact, but only just. Nick Jones was rattling over the curb and dropped back against the recovered Jordan Witt and the recovered Richard Neary. And we had some great racing in GT4 with the HHC McLaren squabbling with Matt Cowley's Ford Mustang, forcing that a little bit deep. And out of all of that, the uh, beneficiary was Chris Westmail, who picked up two places. Michael O'Brien ran wide at Coppice, delayed himself with a wheel or two on the dirt, and that gave Rob Collard a chance to challenge. Adam Ballon undid a bit of his good work by running off the road at the Melbourne Happen, and the time loss would turn out to be crucial because they missed out on a podium by eight tenths of a second. Pit stop cycled through, battles raged on, out on track, with some of the teams pitting later in a hope to have a drier road and maybe run slicks. Eventually, Rob Collard gave way to Sandy Mitchell, but when he did so, 
they'd uh, lost a bit of time relative to the top two and more time was lost by number 96 as off the road slithered Ollie Wilkinson and back on. The lead battle became all about Patrick Cuyler's Mercedes, Andrea Calderelli's Lamborghini and a brilliant move by Calderelli put him round the outside and that gave him the race lead and the race win with up into third place Yelma Berman and Ian Loggy. A Donington debut win for Andrea Calderelli, a first British GT win for Michael Igo, and there's more to come from the Intelligent Money British GT Championship later on for now. From Andy McEwen and David Addison, it's goodbye from Donington.